from the mountains of western North Carolina. Not quite the same as the Rockies here in Colorado, but we like them. Um, very pleased to be here. This is my sixth year participating in this course, and I've really enjoyed seeing this course grow over the years and to the really outstanding um, course that it's become now. And I really feel very privileged to be here. I've been given the unenviable task of, of talking at the end of what I know has been a very long day for you guys. And at least I'm going to be talking about something that I love, and that is uh, trauma, particularly in the lower extremity. So bear with me. We'll try to get through it uh, together and hopefully end on time. Um, we're going to be really, uh, this is the, actually we're doing things a little bit backwards. This is the second trauma lecture, so we're actually going to be starting with acetabular fractures in this talk, and then we're going to finish up and go all the way down to the toes. So this is uh, going to be intended as a comprehensive review, of course, to prepare you for your upcoming board exam. We're going to cover exactly 20 topics in the next two or so hours. I'm going to follow the handout that's in your syllabus pretty much exactly. And I want to uh, emphasize the point that we're going to be covering the so-called board answers today. Um, this is not intended to be a lecture on current hot topics in orthopedic trauma because obviously that's not what you're going to be tested on on your board exam. And hopefully when we get done, uh, neither you nor I will feel like this guy. Let's get right started, and we're going to move pretty quickly with acetabular fractures. Um, acetabular fractures are the result of high-energy blunt trauma. The fracture pattern is predicated by two factors, the, the vector or the force vector that's imparted to the hip joint and the position of the femoral head at the time that force vector is applied. Those, that's what determines the fracture pattern that ensues. Associated injuries to other organ systems are very common with, acetab with acetabular fractures as well as ipsilateral long bone fractures. You have to be aware of that. And these patients all have to go through the rigorous um, you know, ATLS protocol. Um, it's very important that you understand these radiographic landmarks for the acetabulum. I'm going to go through those uh, a little bit here. Uh, line one here which you see uh, illustrated here, is the iliopectineal line. The iliopectineal line is the radiographic landmark for the anterior column of the acetabulum. Line two here, which begins up this way, comes down here and into the obturator foramen, is the ilioischial line, which is the radiographic landmark for the posterior column. This structure here, three, is the teardrop, which is not, of course, an actual anatomical structure, but it's a radiographic uh, finding um, caused by the confluence of the bony structures in that area. But it is a good uh, marker for the presence or absence of protrusio of the femoral head into the, into the pelvis. The four is this little arc right here, which is the very important weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum. This is where we are concerned about fractures that exit through this area being uh, important in uh, terms of the uh, treatment of these injuries. And then five is the anterior wall of the acetabulum, and six is the posterior wall of the acetabulum. Remember that the acetabulum is antiverted, and so the posterior wall projects more laterally, if you will, than the anterior wall. Very important to understand these structures and, when, and get in the habit of looking at each one of them. When you're looking at an AP pelvis x-ray of a patient with an acetabular fracture, you really can glean a lot of information about the fracture pattern that you have. The radiographic evaluation of acetabular fractures always begins with an AP pelvis x-ray. And again, you can start to look at these radiographic landmarks here. You can see, obviously, in this case, that both the iliopectineal and the ilioischial line have been disrupted. So you know right away that you have a fracture involving both the anterior and the posterior column of the acetabulum. The study is then completed with uh, Jude views, the 45-degree oblique views. And I'll show you how those are obtained. And then, of course, the CT scan is important as well. These are the Jude views, which are very easy to take. And don't ever let the tech in your hospital tell you that they don't understand how to do Jude views. As you see, all you do basically is rotate the affected hip up 45 degrees and then rotate the contralateral uninjured hip up 45 degrees. And the beam is oriented directly perpendicular to the gantry. The obturator oblique view is the one that's shown here on the left. You can remember that. Uh, I always do by the fact that it shows the obturator foramen here in profile. The obturator oblique view shows you the anterior column of the acetabulum and the posterior wall, which is right here, number two. The iliac oblique view shows you the posterior column of the acetabulum and less distinctly the anterior wall. So remember, obturator oblique, anterior column, posterior wall, iliac oblique, posterior column, anterior wall. CT scan is very important in the classification and treatment decision-making in acetabular fractures. It allows you to 
to determine the extent of the articular surface involvement, and it also allows you to glean some additional features that you simply can't see from plain films alone. For example, the size of the posterior wall fragments, if they're present. The presence or absence of marginal impaction. This was a CT phenomenon here, and you can see this really has some important treatment implications in, your, in understanding how this fracture is going to have to be reduced and the uh, things that are going to be done to uh, affect the articular reduction. You also are going to be looking for the presence or absence of intraarticular loose bodies, and all these factors come in and pay a, play an important role in your preoperative planning as well as helping you decide which approach you're going to use to fix the fracture. This is the father of vasotabular fracture surgery, Emile Luternel, the uh, eminent uh, French surgeon who passed uh, away a few years ago. And Luternel's classification scheme seems a little bit daunting at first because there are 10 different types of vasotabular fractures. However, it's very logically organized. There are five simple or elementary fractures and then five associated or combination type fractures. The elementary fractures quite simply are the posterior wall, posterior column, anterior wall, anterior column, and the straight transverse fracture. And these are diagrammatically represented here. Here's a posterior wall fracture. Here's a posterior column fracture. And notice that as we go through these diagrams, whenever you have a fracture involving the posterior column, it always exits somewhere into the greater sciatic notch, this particular one here at the superior angle of the greater sciatic notch. Here's an anterior wall fracture, which is actually quite rare. Anterior column fracture is a little bit more common. And the transverse fracture, which is a common fracture pattern. The combination fractures then consist of posterior column plus a posterior wall, transverse plus a posterior wall, which is the most common associated type acetabular fracture. I should mention that the, po the simple posterior wall fracture or the isolated posterior wall fracture is the most common type overall. The T-type fracture, which is the dreaded uh, one that's associated with the worst uh, results. The anterior with the posterior hemitransverse, and that's sort of a cumbersome name that somewhat is related to a difficult translation from the French. You can actually think of that fracture as really a transverse with an anterior wall is a way you can think of it. And then the both columns fracture, the very interesting floating acetabular injury. So here at the top is the posterior column with the posterior wall. Here's a transverse with the posterior wall. Uh, the T-type fracture, the, the difficulty with the T-type fracture is that you have the posterior and anterior columns are both fractured and they are no longer associated to one another. So obtaining a d reduction of one column does not affect reduction of the opposite column. So if you were to approach this T-type fracture here posteriorly and reduce this fracture here into the uh, sciatic notch, that is not necessarily going to result in reduction of the, anterior, of the anterior column. In fact, it usually will not. And these are the fractures that typically will require either an, extended, an extensile approach or some combination of an anterior and posterior approach, which I'll talk about in a moment. Here's the uh, anterior with the posterior hemitransverse. And again, this is sort of just like a, a, a transverse with an anterior wall and the both columns fracture. In the, in the both columns fracture, the, the hallmark of the both columns fracture is that no portion of the acetabular articular surfaces are, are in continuity with the axial skeleton. So here you have this stable iliac wing segment here, which is connected to the skeleton via the sacroiliac joint, but the rest of the acetabulum is actually uh, is, is dissociated from the axial skeleton. And both columns fractures can actually be uh, quite easily treated in many cases. And in fact, some of them can even be treated non-operatively because even though you have significant displacement, the anterior and posterior columns will remain relatively well reduced relative to one another. What, is, what are the indications for non-operative treatment of acetabular fractures? Well, the most important criteria is the femoral head has to be congruent with the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum with the patient out of traction. That's, if you don't have that criteria present, then you can forget all these other things that I've listed on this slide. So if the femoral head is not congruent on your AP pelvis view and your Jude radiographs, then that is an, basically an, <clears throat> an absolute indication for operative intervention in a young adult patient. If the femoral head is congruent and if you have these criteria present, then non-operative treatment is indicated. We generally will accept up to two millimeters of displacement of the acetabular articular surfaces. The roof arcs are very important to understand, uh, defined by Joel Mata. The, the, and this basically refers back to the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum. We were, that's a 45-degree arc, which you see uh, in this portion of the bone here. This is an anterior column acetabular fracture, and on this obturator oblique view, we've measured the 
a roof arc at 66 degrees. So assuming that the, obtrate, the iliac oblique and the AP pelvis views also showed roof arc measurements greater than 45 degrees, this is a fracture that can do very well with non-operative treatment. And you can think of this basically just as like a high superior ramus fracture. Posterior wall fractures in which less than 20% of the wall is involved can be treated non-operatively. And this phenomenon, which I just referred to, of secondary congruence in both column fractures, where although the acetabulum is significantly displaced, the anterior and posterior columns remain relatively well reduced to one another. Non-operative treatment of acetabular fractures consists of protected weight-bearing or non-weight-bearing for approximately 10 to 12 weeks. That's how long it takes the, these fractures to heal. Of course, the patients have to undergo close radiographic follow-up. Uh, and if the, some displacement occurs during your course of treatment, that would be an indication for operative intervention. And remember that skeletal traction is rarely indicated as definitive treatment. If you think that you have to keep a patient in traction to maintain your reduction, then you need to be thinking about operative, operative intervention for that fracture. There are some relative contraindications to surgery, and again, I want to emphasize that these are relative contraindications. As we um, all advance in our own practices, you know, we find ourselves operating more and more on patients that have these criteria. Morbid obesity is certainly one factor to take into consideration. Uh, physiologic age of the patient. An open contaminated wound in the area would certainly be an, a contraindication to immediate surgical intervention. You want to manage the wound and make sure to minimize your risk of soft tissue complications. And then the presence of a deep venous thrombosis it would also, need, also needs to be considered. Well, what are the surgical indications? Um, again, I've, I will mention that if you have incongruency of the femoral head relative to the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum with the patient out of traction, that's an indication for surgical intervention. Displacement of the dome greater than 2 millimeters. Uh, posterior wall fractures greater than 50% uh, typically are unstable and will need surgical intervention. Marginal impaction, which I showed you an example of earlier. Loose bodies in the joint, which need to be removed. Or such as in this case here, this is an irreducible fracture dislocation where you have multiple fragments in the joint. And this would be an indication for uh, relatively, er, relative early surgical intervention for this fracture. What type of surgical approaches are there? Well, they're, they're listed here. The posterior Coker-Langenbach approach is the workhorse approach for posterior column fracture patterns. The anterior ilioinguinal approach similarly is, uh, is the most commonly used approach for anterior fracture patterns. Um, the extensile approaches include the triradiate, which has really fallen out of favor, I would say. The extended iliofemoral still is indicated in certain situations. Or you can do a combined anterior and posterior approach. These are the fracture patterns that are best managed with the coker langenbach and of course that includes the posterior wall, posterior column, most transverse fractures, as well as the transverse with the posterior wall. Again, with transverse fractures, although you may have significant displacement of the anterior column as well, because the anterior column is still associated with the posterior column, by reducing the posterior column under direct visualization through your coker langenbach approach, you can usually obtain anatomical reduction of the anterior column. And then the T fracture is one that often will require a combined approach. Ilioinguinal approach is best for fractures of the anterior wall and anterior column, um, the anterior with, chem with posterior hemitransverse, and both columns fractures. Both columns fractures have typically significant extension of the, into the iliac wing, and they're best approached through an ilioinguinal approach. And you can also, on the operator bleep, you remember for a both columns fracture, the, uh, the hallmark of those fractures radiographically is the spur sign that you see on the obturator oblique image for a both columns fracture. Now, all the surgical approaches have their own inherent risks and potential disadvantages. The posterior uh, coker langenbach approach, what we worry about is iatrogenic injury to the cytic nerve. Even in the most experienced hands, that risk is not zero. And even in Joel Mata's and Emil Luttrell's uh, published series, the incidence is anywhere from 2 to 10%. You also have to worry about uh, the potential for damage to the femoral head blood supply by damaging the medial femoral circumflex artery. With the anterior approach, you're concerned about the possibility of injury to the femoral nerve. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is the, is the, bane, of your, uh, is the bane of the anterior inguinal approach. Uh, it's always in the way. You can get thrombosis of the femoral vessels, and you can get a laceration of the corona mortis, which is present in about 10 to 15% of patients and can lead to significant bleeding. The extended iliofemoral approach, um, it has significant disadvantages in terms of causing massive heterotopic ossification because basically with that approach you're taking down the muscles on both the internal iliac fossa as well as the external iliac fossa. So you're completely skeletonizing the iliac crest, if you will. You can also be, uh, possibly get posterior gluteal muscle necrosis. And with the combined approaches, with the combined anterior and posterior approaches at one setting, 
typically what you do is put the patient in the so-called floppy lateral position, and that really can lead to suboptimal visualization. You get kind of crappy exposure through the posterior approach and suboptimal exposure through the anterior approach. So um, in my personal practice, what I prefer to, is to do those under separate anesthetic procedures. Complications of acetabular fractures are many, and they're listed here. Um, we'll go through some of these a little bit more. Heterotopic ossification, the highest incidence, again, is with the extensile approaches. The lowest incidence is with the ilioinguinal approach, and you do not need prophylaxis for an anterior ilioinguinal exposure. With posterior cochlear Langenbach or extensile approaches, you can either do endomethacin for six weeks postoperatively. If you're doing endomethacin, it's very important that it be started immediately postoperatively, or you can do low-dose radiation therapy. There's not been shown to be any statistically significant difference demonstrated between those two techniques. Osteonecrosis occurs in 6 to 7% of all acetabular fractures. However, if you look just at posterior fracture patterns, the incidence is approached as 1 in 5, and obviously that's a dreaded complication. Post-traumatic degenerative joint disease is the most common complication of acetabular fractures. Um, it often can occur even in spite of anatomical reduction, but if you do not have an anatomical reduction, it will occur virtually 100% of the time. So it's critically important to get an anatomical reduction of the weight-bearing dome to prevent the patient from developing post-traumatic arthrosis. If the patient does develop this complication, then the treatment options include hip fusion, which is increasingly less frequently used, and I think it's fair to say in 2005, or total hip arthroplasty. Remember, however, that the results of total hip replacement after acetabular fractures are not as good as total hips done for osteoarthritis. It's exactly analogous to doing a total knee replacement after tibial plateau fracture versus for osteoarthritic indications. Let's move on down and talk about hip dislocations and femoral head fractures, intercapsular hip injuries. Um, hip dislocations typically occur in young patients with high energy trauma. The mechanism is, is an axial load injury to the thigh with the hip flex, the, the so-called dashboard injury. They're relatively rare, but they can have a high instance of complications and late sequelae. Uh, remember that the hip joint is one of the most stable joints in the body. The, the combination of the, of the bony anatomy, the fact that the, the femoral head is recessed into the, into the socket of the acetabulum, then you have this very strong osteocartilaginous labrum, as well as the multiple ligamentous and muscular structures that traverse the hip joint. All of those factors combined make the hip joint inherently stable, and therefore when you have a hip dislo dislocation, you know that there has been significant force imparted to that joint. The physical examination findings are often uh, diagnostic. Um, you can often look very smart just by standing at the foot of the bed. When this patient rolls into your trauma bay, you see he's got a laceration of the anterior aspect of his knee. This is his right leg. His foot was jammed against the brake uh, at the time of the impact. His foot went against the dashboard. He's got an open patella fracture. And notice that this extremity is shortened, a little bit internally rotated, and at a deducted. That's the classic presentation for a posterior hip dislocation. Posterior hip dislocations much more common than anterior dislocations. Anterior dislocation uh, will present with flexion of the extremity, abduction, abduction, and external rotation. So the, the physical examination is very important. Associated injuries with hip dislocations include both intracapsular and extracapsular injuries. The intracapsular injuries consist of femoral head fractures, femoral neck fractures, and acetabular fractures. This is a patient that has both an acetabular fracture and a femoral head fracture. And then we also are concerned about the potential for extracapsular injuries, such as sciatic nerve injuries, which in a, can occur anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the time in patients with hip dislocations. Very important to do a focused neurologic exam. Uh, and then ipsilateral lower extremity fractures. Imaging, uh, remember that once you do your reduction of the hip dislocation, the patient must have a post-reduction CT scan. And what you're looking for specifically are three things. We're looking for those intracapsular injuries that I mentioned, fracture of the femoral head, the uh, acetabular fractures, or the presence of intraarticular loose bodies that will lead to a non-congruent reduction of the femoral head within the acetabulum. And often you can pick this up on the AP pelvis x-ray, and you can see that there will be lateral displacement of the femoral head within the socket. The treatment for hip dislocations is an emergent uh, closed reduction. Gentle is somewhat of an oxymoron, of course, with this procedure. But the point is that you want to try to get the, the, the best sedation that you can get and do the reduction maneuver with as, with as little trauma to the femoral head as possible. We like to reduce the hip dislocation whenever possible within six hours. 
If you look back in the literature, there's nothing that you can hang your hat on that definitively will show you that eight hours is worse than four hours, but that's what's, in the, that's what's out there and that's uh, what's commonly reported in the textbooks. For posterior hip dislocations, the, you can do the reduction with the patient supine. You apply traction in line with the deformity and then it reverse the deformity. So you're going, for a posterior hip dislocation, you're going to apply external rotation and abduction force to the hip to reduce it. And then it's very important to assess the stability of the hip post-reduction. And that's somewhat of an underappreciated um, physical examination finding. But by flexing the hip up, um, oftentimes if you have the luxury of, of uh, having fluoro available when you do this, that you can really look for subluxation of the posterior head with your range of motion of the hip joint. And if you see subluxation, that's an indication that your reduction is unstable and something's going need to be done operatively to, to stabilize that. Um, if you have incarcerated fragments within the joint, those need to be removed. If you have a femoral head fracture and or an acetabular fracture, then you apply the criteria for those fractures individually to determine whether or not the patient needs surgery. If you have a hip joint that is stable and does not have any associated injuries either to the femoral head or the acetabulum, then the standard treatment for these injuries is protected weight bearing for a very brief period of time, two to four weeks. And these patients typically, after about two weeks, will begin to weight bear to, to, to tolerance and, and do quite well. Complications of hip dislocations uh, can include osteonecrosis of the femoral head. Of course, that's the big concern when the hip is dislocated. The blood supply to the femoral head is compromised. And the overall instance in, in large series of hip dislocations has been reported at about 15%. The most common complication, however, is actually post-traumatic arthritis. And recurrent dislocations of the hip, remember, are rare, again, because the hip joint is inherently stable as opposed to, for example, the shoulder joint. Now, femoral head fractures are always associated with hip dislocations. It's extremely unusual to see a patient with a femoral head fracture that did not have a, a hip dislocation. If you look at all posterior hip dislocations, 7% of them will have a femoral head fracture. The Pipkin classification is important to remember because it does have therapeutic and uh, 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 implications. Type 1 fractures are those in which the fracture is below the ligamentum, a very small inferior head fragment that typically does not involve the major weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. A type 2 fracture is a much larger fracture that extends above the ligamentum. A type 3 is a, either a 1 or a 2 with an associated fracture of the femoral neck. It's a very serious fracture. And then a type 4 is a quite common injury where you have a 1 or a 2 with an associated acetabular fracture. The treatment algorithm is quite simply to reduce the hip dislocation. Then, as I talked about, once you've reduced the hip dislocation, you get a CT scan post-reduction to assess, number one, for the presence or absence of femoral head fracture and also for the, the quality of the reduction of that femoral head fracture. The indications for open reduction and internal fixation in femoral head fractures basically consist of any step-off. You really cannot accept any displacement of the femoral head and again, I'm talking about a, a basically a Pipkin II fracture that involves a portion of the weight-bearing portion of the femoral head. Also, if you have loose bodies within the joint, that would lead to an incongruent reduction of the hip. If you have a, an associated fracture of the femoral neck or the as, posterior acetabulum, or you can consider operative indications in a polytrauma patient where you want to try to mobilize the patient, uh, that that might be an indication for ORF, even the, in, in the presence of a non-displaced fracture. For Pipkin 1 and 2 injuries, if you have an adequate reduction, meaning basically an anatomical reduction, then you can consider non-operative treatment four to six weeks of touchdown weight bearing. If you have an inadequate reduction with any displacement, then that would be an indication for ORIF. Pipkin 3 fractures, there is absolutely zero role for closed reduction in these injuries. These fractures obviously have a very high incidence of avascular necrosis. There's a double hit, if you will, to the femoral head because of the disruption of the femoral head blood supply caused by the displaced neck fracture, as well as the damage to the femoral head itself with the fracture of the head. If you have a young, active patient with a relatively minimally displaced neck fracture, then you can consider performing open reduction and internal, and internal fixation of the femoral neck. It's essential to obtain an anatomical reduction and fix the head fragment at the same time. Other patients that do not meet these criteria probably would best be managed with uh, prosthetic replacement of the proximal femur. Pipkin 4, uh, again, these are the fractures of the femoral head associated with a posterior acetabular fracture. You treat those as dictated by the acetabular fracture. If the acetabular fracture meets operative indications, then the patient should undergo primary ORF of that, uh, and then you would want to combine that with internal fixation for the head fracture so that you can allow the patient to have early range of motion of the hip joint.
The surgical approach that should be used to address femoral head fractures is a, is a little bit controversial. It, if you think about the fact that most of these are the result of posterior hip dislocations, it seems to make intuitive sense that you would want to go posterior to approach these fractures. That's actually not the case. Um, you might be concerned about the potential for further compromise to the vascularity of the femoral head by an anterior approach, but that theoretical concern has not been proven to be a, a, be a practical concern. So the, the, the best way to approach these fractures, again, because they're typically located in the anterior inferior portion of the femoral head, is through an anterior Smith-Peterson approach. This approach, of course, utilizes the internervous plane between the superior gluteal nerve and the femoral nerves, uh, superficially it's between the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata, and then your deep dissections between the gluteus medius and the rectus. Um, this gives you much better visualization of the femoral head fragment. You can actually reduce and fix these fractures without formally dislocating the, the hip. And there's, again, there's not been shown to be any increased risk of osteonecrosis by approaching these fractures in this manner. All right, we'll move on down now and talk about femoral neck fractures. Uh, femoral neck fractures are, are increasingly prevalent. Um, due to uh, more aging in our population. They typically are seen in women more than men, in Caucasian patients more than African American patients, and they typically, in, in comparison to patients that have extra capsular hip fractures, they, they often, they usually occur in younger patients as opposed to intertrope fractures, for example. In young patients, femoral neck fractures are the result of high energy trauma, and of course, in older patients, they're typically the result of much lower energy falls. And the age of the patient, the physiologic age of the patient, I should say, is really the most important factor in determining both the treatment and the risk of complications. And I'll show you a treatment algorithm in just a minute. Uh, for the anatomy of the proximal femur, remember that the normal neck shaft angle is, a, is 130 degrees with 7 degrees of variation in, uh, on either side of that. So there really is a very wide uh, difference between the native uh, neck, neck shaft angle and the normal antiversion similarly can anywhere, be anywhere from 3 degrees to 17 degrees with an average of about 10 degrees. Remember the blood supply to the femoral head, the primary blood supply comes from the medial femoral circumflex artery, um, which courses up in the region near the quadratus femoris, if, you, if you're familiar with that structure with your posterior approach. There is some minor contribution from the lateral femoral circumflex artery, which supplies the anterior and inferior portion of the femoral head. Again, that's not the primary weight-bearing portion of the femoral head. Then there's an insignificant supply also through the artery, artery of the ligamentum teres. So the, uh, the blood supply of the femoral head is an important, very important factor in femoral neck fractures because displacement of the femoral neck will inevitably disrupt the blood supply. And that often leads to the development of an intracapsular hematoma. And this intracapsular hematoma has really been the subject of much debate among orthopedic trauma surgeons as to the significance of it on the, um, on the reestablishment of the blood supply of the femoral head. There are many authors that believe that this hematoma must be decompressed in order to reestablish blood supply although that is controversial. Uh, the radiographic di uh, evaluation of femoral neck fracture should consist of an AP pelvis x-ray. And again, I want to urge you to really uh, rely on your AP pelvis so that you do have your contralateral control with your normal hip. Uh, Cross-table lateral can also, be, also often be very important for picking up subtle uh, incomplete fractures that aren't seen on the AP. And if you suspect an occult fracture, the diagnostic procedure of choice, of course, is an MRI with T1 weighted image. The garden classification scheme for femoral neck fractures is in the literature, and it's important to understand it, but it's less commonly used for uh, practical considerations today. A type 1 fracture is an incomplete valgus impacted fracture, and you notice the disturbance of the stress lines through the femoral neck here. A type 2 fracture is a complete fracture that is non-displaced. A type 3 is a complete fracture which is displaced less than 50%, and a type 4 is one where you have complete displacement of the, of the femoral neck. Now, in terms of the results and the instance of complications, we re it's, I think it's most important really to talk about femoral neck fractures simply whether it's displaced or not. And we consider the non-displaced fractures to, the, to be basically the garden one and two fractures, and the displaced fractures would then be the garden three and four. So this, to me, is just a, is a, is a displaced femoral neck fracture is the, is the most common way to describe it. Now, it's also important to understand Powell's classification of femoral neck fractures, and that's based on the orientation of the fracture line. As you go from a Powell's 1 to a Powell's 3, notice that the fracture line becomes increasingly vertical. 
and there's a higher incidence of complications, specifically non-union and osteonecrosis, as you go from a Powell's 1 to a Powell's 3. The problem here with the Powell's 3 is that there are tremendous shear forces across this fracture due to the native forces that, that cross the hip joint, and so that makes the Powell's 3 fracture very unstable. And so that's an important thing to look for, particularly in young adult patients, because the Powell's 3 fractures often occur more commonly in younger patients with high energy trauma. Now the treatment for femoral neck fractures, there is a general consensus among orthopedic surgeons that the majority of femoral neck fractures, regardless in, in the patient that they occur in, should be fixed. In other words, we believe that non-displaced fractures should be fixed to prevent displacement and to facilitate pain-free mobilization of the patient. So in other words, unless there's very significant medical contraindications, there are very few situations where non-operative treatment of femoral neck fractures should be considered. Even uh, fractures, uh, stress fractures along the tension side of the femoral neck, the superior side of the femoral neck, should be treated operatively even in young patients to prevent later displacement. Now, the treatment recommendations are based on two factors. The first factor is the presence or absence of displacement, which we talked about, and also the physiologic age of the patient. It's important not to get hung up on the chronologic age, but really the physiologic age of the patient. How, how functional is the patient? What are the patient's uh, expectations and demands? And we consider physiologically young patients to be basically less than 50, although I might move that up a little bit as I keep giving this lecture for a few more years. Um, this, is, this is a very useful algorithm for femoral neck fractures and something I think you should keep in your, in, your data, in your memory bank. And this is really a very logical way to think about these injuries. If you have a non-displaced femoral neck fracture, and that includes the Garden 1 valgus impacted fracture, then those fractures should be treated in most patients unless significant medical contraindications exist with internal fixation with cannulated screws. Simple procedure. You can do it with, through a very small incision with very limited morbidity to the patient. If you have a displaced fracture, then you consider whether the patient is physiologically young or physiologically old. If the patient is physiologically young, then you can consider doing a closed reduction, and by closed reduction, I mean closed reduction in the operating room. And if you obtain an anatomical reduction through closed techniques, good for you, and you can go ahead and stabilize that patient with internal fixation with cannulated screws. However, if you are unable to obtain an anatomical reduction in a physio physiologically young patient, you must do an open reduction to obtain that anatomical reduction, then proceed with stable internal fixation. On the other hand, if you have a physiologically old patient, then those are the patients in which you would consider an endoprosthesis. And we can talk about whether you're going to do a, a hemiarthroplasty or a total hip replacement. Internal fixation, um, the way to do that is with parallel Kinsella screws, and remember that your screws should be placed at or above the level of the lesser trochanter. Avoid placing your screws down here below the lesser trochanter because that creates a significant stress riser in the proximal femur, and these patients can and will fracture if they have cannulated screws down in this region of the, of the proximal femur. You can, get, you can typically use three screws if the fracture does not have significant comminution. If, there, if you see on your preoperative radiographic studies that significant posterior comminution exists, then you can consider adding a fourth screw. For the base of neck fracture or the base of cervical fracture, a, a, a good implant of choice for that it would be a sliding hip screw plus or minus a more proximal derotation screw. Prosthetic replacement for femoral neck fractures is indicated for the physiologically older patients with displaced fractures. In debilitated patients, a hemiarthroplasty is the treatment of choice. In patients that you know have severe pre-existing hip disease and are functional, then you may consider doing a primary total hip replacement in that situation. Now, hemiarthroplasty, a couple things to remember. Uh, I think it's fair to say the literature now supports that this, the results for cemented hemiarthroplasty clearly are superior to the results for uncemented arthroplasty. By contrast, the issue of whether you could do a unipolar or a bipolar is still quite controversial, and there's no consensus on that in the literature. Um, you can do a, your hemiarthroplasty through either a posterior approach or an anterolateral approach. Each has its own inherent disadvantage. The posterior approach, of course, is associated with an inc a higher risk of dislocation postoperatively, whereas the anterolateral approach is associated with a higher problems with uh, abductor weakness. The treatment in a young patient now, a physiologically young patient, a displaced fracture should be considered a surgical emergency. Again, because we're trying to reestablish blood supply to the femoral head and minimize the risk of osteonecrosis and or nonunion, 
Anatomical reduction is essential. If you cannot get an anatomical reduction through closed techniques, then a Watson-Jones anterolateral approach is indicated um, to visualize the femoral neck, establish the anatomical uh, reduction, and proceed with your stable internal fixation. Again, fixation with cancellous screws is the treatment of choice. And remember that in young patients with femoral neck fractures, there is a significantly increased risk of both nonunion and osteonecrosis. Um, so here, to, in summary, in older patient, uh, if you have a non-displaced fracture, you treat that fracture with, can, with uh, parallel cancellous screws, internal fixation. If you have a displaced fracture, then um, doing a closed reduction and inter proceeding with internal fixation versus proceeding with prosthetic replacement is somewhat controversial. The one thing that we do know is that if you do internal fixation, the literature supports that there is less perioperative morbidity. In other words, you're making it, you're performing smaller incisions and it's generally shorter surgery with less, than, less anesthetic time, less blood loss. However, there is an, clearly an increased risk of secondary surgery being required. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. And if you have a truly debilitated patient, then there's really no indication for internal fixation in that situation, and those patients should have a, a prosthetic replacement of the proximal femur. Now, osteonecrosis as a complication of femoral neck fractures occurs anywhere from 10% to 45% of the time in the literature. The factors that are associated with an increased risk of osteonecrosis include increased initial displacement of the fracture, uh, increased time between the fracture and the time that you do your reduction, and, of course, obtaining a non-anatomical reduction. The treatment for osteonecrosis, if you have a physiologically young patient that has less than 50% involvement of the head, then a valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy is the treatment of choice. And I'll show you a diagrammatic representation of that. If you have a young patient with more extensive head involvement, then you can consider doing a salvage procedure such as a free vascularized fibular graft uh, or a total hip arthroplasty. In an older patient, uh, prosthetic replacement would be the treatment of choice. Now, this is the Powell's valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy. And again, notice that this very vertically oriented fracture line here, the femoral neck, this patient probably has not only osteonecrosis of the femoral head, but probably also nonunion. And by performing this valgus osteotomy, you're converting this vertically oriented fracture line into a much more horizontal fracture line. Then you can harness these physiologic forces across the hip joint and obtain interfragmentary compression across your femoral neck fracture to get uh, effective union. And this has been shown to be a very effective technique for these situations with success rates in the 80 to 90 percent range. Non-unions um, as a complication is defined really as no healing at 12 months, so you really um, are, have waited for a long time for these fractures to heal. The instance is anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, so a little bit less common than osteonecrosis. If you have a patient with a non-union, it's probably necessary to get an MRI scan to evaluate the viability of the femoral head because that will be important in your decision making. If the head is viable, then you can do a valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy as I just showed you. If the head is non-viable or if you're in an older patient, then prosthetic replacement would be the way to go. All right, let's move on uh, down extracapsular hip fractures. Intertroch fractures uh, occur in older patients than that femoral neck fractures, and typically these patients are not only older but a little bit sicker with more medical comorbidities. Um, so they have the risk factors of osteoporosis as well as their medical issues. In young patients, intertrochanteric fractures are the result of high energy trauma and typically present with uh, much more comminution. The diagnosis, again, your AP pelvis, x-ray, your cross table lateral are necessary. Um, on physical examination, we'll be looking for a painful, shortened, and externally rotated lower extremity. The classification for intertroch fractures is really uh, uh, clinically into stable versus unstable. The stable fractures are those which you believe will resist medial compressive load once reduced. And you'd be concerned about this, the, the stability of this fracture here where you have this very large you know, lesser trochanteric fragment. Unstable fractures will collapse into varus or more commonly the shaft will displace medially despite obtaining good axial reduction of the fracture fragments. The treatment for intertroch fractures, uh, if you have a patient that was previously ambulatory, then surgical intervention is indicated um, to obtain reduction in fixation of the fracture. And remember that early surgery within 48 hours has been shown in the literature to be associated with decreased one-year mortality. So it is to the patient's benefit to get these patients to the operating room early and fix these intertroch fractures. Not necessarily the night they come in, but certainly uh, whenever possible within 24 hours. The goal of your treatment, or your surgical treatment for intertroch fractures is to obtain correct alignment between the neck and the shaft of the bone and to correct the translation. 
you do not have to obtain anatomical reduction of the intermediate fragments. Specifically, the lesser trochanter does not need to be anatomically reduced in order for you to have a successful fracture healing. And remember that a medial displacement osteotomy of the proximal femur is of no practical benefit in these, in these injuries. The surgical treatment for intertroch fractures, the gold standard implant for uh, most intertroch fractures remains a sliding hip compression screw and side plate. The benefit of this technique is that it allows you to harness the physiologic forces across the, fra across the hip joint and obtain thereby dynamic interfragmentary compression, which leads to a very high rate of union. Um, the problem with this technique is that if you have an unstable fracture pattern, as the uh, hip screw slides within the barrel of the side plate, you can get medial displacement of the shaft, which can cause some problems with the mechanics of the hip joint. Now remember, as far as positioning your, your proximal lag screw for intertroch fractures as well as subtroch fractures, that the center, center position is best. Center on the AP image, center on the lateral image. That is associated with the lowest rate of cutout. Also remember the importance of the tip to apex distance. You want to place the tip of your screw within one centimeter of the subchondral bone on both your AP and your lateral image. And if you look at your postoperative AP and lateral images and your tip to apex distance is less than 25 millimeters, then the risk of cutout has been shown to be virtually zero. You can also consider in unstable fracture patterns doing a mild valgus over reduction to prevent the medial displacement that I described. Now, what about hip screws or cephalomedullary implants for intertrochanteric fractures? There's been a lot of interest in that, in these implants in the literature in the last few years, and many randomized prospective studies have been reported in the literature. Um, this allows you to get intramedullary fixation. The benefit of this technique is that in unstable fracture patterns, it will pre prevent excessive collapse of the fracture and medialization of the femoral shaft. If you have an intramedullary implant, the shaft simply can't go medially, and that's an important factor in unstable fracture patterns. Also, it has the theoretical advantage, at least, of being able to be done through a percutaneous, uh, a much smaller incision, possibly faster rehabilitation of the patient. Um, the one potential disadvantage is that it does create a stress riser in the proximal femur, and there have been an instance reported of, of fractures at the tip of the, of the prosthesis. Now, this is a very important point to remember, the, the so-called reverse oblique intertroch fracture. Remember, and this the, seems to be a favorite question of standardized, standardized exams in orthopedics, you cannot use a sliding hip compression screw and side plate in a reverse oblique inter, uh, intertroch fracture. The treatment of choice for these injuries is some sort of 95-degree fixed angle device, either a blade plate or more commonly used probably is the dynamic condor screw. So remember, do not use a sliding hip compression screw and side plate. That is going to invariably lead to a non-union in these reverse oblique fractures. Post-operative treatment for intertroch fractures uh, should be weight-bearing as tolerated. Um, Ken Caval's work and his, his partners from New York has really shown this definitively over the last few years that there's no benefit in these patients to trying to protect their weight-bearing status, let them weight-bear to tolerance. The cog cognitively intact patients will auto-protect their hips, it's believed, if their fracture pattern is unstable. And the most common complication after intertrochanteric fractures is implant failure, either cut out of the screw or, in this case, uh, disengagement of the screw from the barrel of the side plate. Now, what about subtroke fractures? Subtroke fractures are typically high energy trauma, uh, the result of high energy trauma, and usually occur in younger patients than patients with intertroke fractures. We define the subtrochanteric region of the femur as extending from the lesser trochanter to five centimeters distally. And remember that subtroke fractures, particularly high energy ones, may have proximal intertrochanteric extension. And when that's the case, we refer to them either as peritrochanteric or paratrochanteric fractures. The problem with subtrochanteric femur fractures is that there are many strong muscular forces with long lever arms and bending moments acting on the proximal femur. As diagrammatic, diagrammatically represented here, you see that the, the um, abductors are pulling the proximal fragment into abduction, the uh, iliopsoas is pulling it into flexion, and the adductors here are pulling the, the distal shaft fragment into a deduction. So these, this leads to a very high compressive forces along the medial cortex of the proximal femur and high tensile forces laterally. Also, this is the region, of course, where you're undergoing a transition from cortical bone to cancellous bone. The result of all these factors is that there is a very high rate of non-union in the literature reported for subtrochanteric fractures, and what you typically will see is that the implant will fail before the bone heals.
The classification of subtrochanteric fractures is a little bit cumbersome. Um, I don't think you'll be tested on it, but it does have, it's important to understand it because it does have some treatment implications. This, the Russell-Taylor classification scheme and basically is broken down into type 1 versus 2. Type 1 fractures are those that do not have extension into the piriformis fossa, and the type 2 fractures are those peritrochanteric or per peritrochanteric fractures that do have extension into the greater trochan or with involvement of the piriformis fossa. And you specifically want to look on your lateral x-ray of the proximal femur for a piriformis fossa extension. Now, in the OTA AO standardized fracture compendium, remember that the femur is the third bone. The proximal segment of that bone would be one. So these are 31 A3 fractures. Intramedullary fixation for subtroch fractures has the distinct benefit of preserving the vascularity of the fracture fragments because you do not need to make a big incision and expose the fracture to, to place the intramedullary implant. It also allows you to take advantage of the load sharing uh, uh, features of the, of the implant. Also, if you're doing a reamed application, you can get a bone graft effect from the reaming. And in unstable fracture patterns, intramedullary fixation is a much stronger construct in subtroch fractures than an extramedullary plate type application. Now, a couple things to remember, however, that as opposed to a fracture of the femoral shaft, where when you insert the nail, you can actually uh, use the nail itself to obtain reduction of the fracture, you can't take advantage of that fact with subtroch fractures. So when you place the implant, you basically have to have the subtroch fracture reduced. And also, in type 2 fractures, where you have proximal extension into the piriformis fossa, intramedullary fixation may be contraindicated. Now, what are the options for intramedullary fixation? Well, you have a first-generation IM nail, which is probably uh, not commonly used now, a second-generation or reconstruction-type nail, or a cephalomedullary device, such as an uh, intramedullary hip screw, which has the advantage of being able to be inserted through the greater trochanter. And you actually can take advantage of, and use these types of implants in type 2 fractures that have proximal extension into the piriformis fossa, where you would not be able to use a more standard first- or second-generation IM nail. What about extramedullary plate fixation? Well, you can, consider, you can consider doing a fixed angle device such as a dynamic condylar screw or a blade plate with a long side plate. The problem with an, a, 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 a procedure like this, of course, is that it does significantly compromise the vascularity of the fracture fragments. And as I just mentioned, in unstable fracture patterns, this is a much less strong construct than an intramedullary type of fixation. And these are the types of cases where it's basically a race between the healing of the bone and the breakage of the plate or the screws. And often the, 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 the failure of the plate uh, comes first. If you have significant medial comminution, you, could, you can consider bone grafting if you're doing a plate fixation. And this, and this type of fixation may be indicated in certain type 2 fractures where you have significant proximal extension that would um, obviate uh, the potential for performing intramedullary fixation. So in summary, if you have a fracture that's well below the lesser trochanter, a type 1 fracture without proximal extension into the greater trochanter, then you can consider doing a standard first-generation intramedullary nail. If you have a fracture above the lesser trochanter, which is type 1, without uh, proximal extension, then you can do either a second-generation IM nail or an extramedullary plate device would be acceptable in that indication. If you have a type 2 fracture, um, which does have proximal extension into the piriformis fossa with a fracture below the lesser trochanter, a cephalomedullary type fixation with intramedullary rod and proximal fixation in the femoral head and neck, such as an iron hip screw, is an excellent option. Plate device would be, uh, I think, clearly number two, the, the second best option in that situation. If you have a fracture above the lesser trochanter, so a very high fracture, uh, type two, um, piriformis fossa extension, then that may be the one indication where a fixed angle plate device may be the treatment of choice. What about complications of subtroke fractures? I've already mentioned implant failure and loss of fixation. Non-union, which would be defined at uh, six months post-treatment. You can also get malunion, uh, length and rotational differences if you're not careful with your uh, treatment technique. Now, moving on down, talk about femoral shaft fractures. Uh, femoral shaft fractures, of course, are the result of high energy uh, trauma. You must follow the ATLS protocol because they typically do present in patients that are multiply injured. Uh, so associated injuries are quite common in patients with femur fractures. Remember also, beware of the patient with bilateral femur fractures because those are the patients that can get into significant systemic complications, particularly pulmonary complications from their traumatic injuries. The evaluation is very important to look for the presence or absence of soft tissue wounds that could herald 
the, the presence of an open fracture. And as with all extremity injuries, it's critically important to do a very careful assessment of the distal neurovascular status. Uh, you want AP and lateral x-rays of the entire femur. Remember that you sh must visualize both the hip joint proximally and the knee joint distally um, when you're looking at your preoperative x-rays of femur fractures. Now, the reason, one of the important reasons for that is because of the incidence of ipsilateral femoral neck fractures. If you look at all, if you look at all femoral shaft fractures, the, the incidence of an ipsilateral femoral neck fracture is only 3%. However, the significance of it is that the literature supports that this ipsilateral neck fracture is missed up to 30% of the time. If you have a highly comminuted fracture of the mid shaft of the bone, those are the cases where you really should uh, suspect that there could be a femoral neck fracture, and you have to rule it out. Now, we classify femoral shaft fractures based on their location, whether they're in the proximal third, the middle third, or the distal third, as well as by the degree of comminution, the Winquist uh, classification scheme, which I'll show you. And uh, the OTA with these fractures would be 32 fractures, the femur being the third bone, the diaphysis of that bone being the second segment of, of the femur. Um, this is the Winquist classification scheme, which is important to remember that Winquist zero is ac absolutely no comminution. A one is a very small, uh, insignificant amount of comminution. A, a Winquist two would be a, a butterfly fragment where there's greater than 50% cortical contact. A three is a much larger amount of comminution where there's less than 50% cortical contact. And a Winquist four is where you essentially have a segmental fracture with no contact between the primary proximal and distal shaft fragments. The treatment for femoral shaft fractures, well, uh, traction is really of historical interest only. Um, I can't think of an indication where traction would be indicated for a treatment of femoral shaft fracture definitively in 2005. External fixation can be a very important adjunct in the treatment of femoral shaft fractures, particularly in the, in the, in the arena of damage control orthopedics, which is one of the hot buzzwords in orthopedic trauma now. Uh, plate fixation uh, is indicated in certain situations, and of course the, the gold standard for treatment of femoral shaft fractures is intramedullary nailing. Now, external fixation uh, can be an important adjunct in managing these injuries, particularly in very unstable, polytraumatized patients, patients with severe open fractures with massive soft tissue injury, um, or patients with associated vascular injuries that are, have to undergo vascular repair, where you want to do something to stabilize the bone in conjunction with the vascular repair. And this gets into the realm of damage control orthopedics. You know, the patient that comes in with a very severe closed head injury, uh, unstable hemodynamic is it should not go to the operating room on the night of injury for a potentially prolonged intramedullary nailing. However, I would argue that that patient would greatly benefit from a very uh, simple two-pin or four-pin external fixator to s simply realign, maintain the length and alignment of the femur, and then we can go back and definitively treat the, the femur fracture once the patient is medically stable. Um, the problem with external fixation as definitive treatment for, ex for femur fractures is that the pin tract problems are frequent and knee stiffness is quite common due to the binding of the quadriceps mechanism. And remember that if you have an external fixator on a femur, the literature does support that that external fixator can be safely converted to an intramedullary nail at a single stage procedure within two to three weeks. And that study came from the uh, shock trauma, the institution where I did my fellowship. The treatment, uh, plate fixation, is usually reserved for very special indications. For example, the patient with an ipsilateral neck shaft fracture, where you want to do a separate procedure to obtain anatomical reduction in fixation of the neck, you may consider putting a plate on in that situation. The problem with plates compared to nails is that they do have a higher incidence of infection, a higher incidence of nonunion, and a higher incidence of implant failure. So there's no question that the literature supports that it is an inferior technique in comparison with intramedullary nailing we may be seeing some uh, improved results with more percutaneous plating techniques. Intramedullary nailing is the treatment of choice for the vast majority of femoral shaft fractures, and I challenge you to find any procedure that we do in all of orthopedics that has a higher success rate reported than intramedullary nailing of a femoral shaft fracture. As you all are aware, the union rates are reported anywhere from 98 to 99 percent with an infection rate of uh, less than 2 percent. So complications are infrequent and union is, uh, is, is, the, is the rule typically in these fractures. Now what about the timing of stabilization? Well, early stabilization of femoral shaft fractures, by early I mean within 24 hours post-injury, has been shown to be associated with several important clinical benefits to the patient, specifically decreased incidence of pulmonary complications, decreased incidence of thromboembolic complications, 
improved rehabilitation of the patient, and perhaps even most importantly in 2005 with economics of medicine being as it is, you know, decreased stay in the ICU, uh, decreased hospital stay, and decreased overall cost of the hospitalization. The one caveat to that that I've already mentioned is beware the patient that has a severe closed head injury. In that patient, it is critically important to avoid hypotension and hypoxemia, and therefore those patients are probably best managed with a more provisional type fixation technique such as external fixation to make sure that you're not doing anything else that could potentially harm the patient. And as we all know, when the patients go to the operating room and get under the control of the anesthesia team, um, we feel like you know, as, as trauma surgeons that we lose control of the patient and uh, we want to make sure that the patients do not get hypotensive or hypoxemic. Um, so this, this ARDS is what we're trying to pre prevent by uh, early stabilizing femoral shaft fractures. Now, as far as the technique for intermedullary nailing, I think it's fair to say that st a statically locked, antegrade, reamed nail inserted through the piriformis fossa remains the gold standard. And I've been giving this talk since 1999, and I think that this is still true in 2005, although, you know, we're ever evolving new techniques that are challenging this. Interlocking fixation for intermedullary nailing is always statically lock. Let me repeat that. Always statically lock. There is no indication for a dynamically locked intermedullary nail. We've been there, done that in the literature. There, you know, the union rates are 98 to 99 percent with a statically locked nail. You cannot predict, based on your preoperative or postoperative x-rays, which fractures are stable and which ones are unstable. So all of them should be statically locked proximally and distally. What about the uh, issue of approach, antegrade versus retrograde? Well, if you're doing an antegrade nail, it's critically important to obtain a, a proper starting point in the piriformis fossa. And you guys may be the last generation of orthopedic surgeons that even know how to find the piriformis fossa with the way things are going with uh, both retrograde nailing and trochanteric nailing. But you can do this uh, through on a fracture, either on a fracture table with traction applied, or you can do it on a radiolucent table without traction. It's very important that you, on your fluoroscopic views, you see that you're right in line with the, the shaft of the femur in both your AP and lateral images. Now, what about retrograde nailing, where there's no question that retrograde nailing is technically easier, it's increasingly popular, and I think it's fair to say that the recent you know, prospective series show that the union rates are comparable to what we've seen historically with antegrade nailing. There are some potential complications with retrograde nailing that are at least theoretically of concern, and that includes cartilage injury, damage to the knee joint itself, and who knows what these knee joints are going to be like, you know, 15, 20 years down the road. Um, you can potentially introduce intraarticular infection by opening up the intermedullary canal to the knee joint, and there has been shown to be some uh, uh, potential for damage to the, the blood supply to the cruciate ligaments and resulting cruciate ligament injury. Retrograde nailing, well, there are some currently clearly accepted indications where retrograde nailing would be the treatment of choice, and that would include the morbidly obese patient, the patient with the ipsilateral tibial shaft fracture of the so-called floating knee, where you're going to do a retrograde nail of the femur and an antegrade nail of the tibia through the same incision, ipsilateral neck shaft fractures, a very uh, useful indication for this retrograde technique, ipsilateral acetabular fractures, where you want to avoid making any incisions proximally that could potentially compromise your later surgical approach to the acetabulum, traumatic knee arthrotomies where you have a very clean wound and you're going to be in the knee joint anyway, washing out the joint and closing it, and the patient with bilateral femur fractures simply to facilitate um, the, your intraoperative care of the patient. You can put the patient's spine on the fracture table and do bilateral retrograde nailing without too much difficulty. Now, what about the issue of reamed versus unreamed? Well, unreamed nailing has the theoretical advantage of decreased pulmonary embolization. And that has been shown to be a, a, a phenomenon that's been demonstrated in animal studies in the lab. However, in human studies, clinical series with reaming have not been shown to lead to deleterious pulmonary effects. And unreamed studies have been shown to be associated with both decreased union rates and increased time to union. So the, res the end result of that is that reamed insertion is now, it remains the preferred technique for, femor for femoral nailing. Um, remember that the reamer design and technique are, are important. You want to have a reamer that has, sh of course, it needs to be sharp, which is often a problem in most of our hospitals, but the flutes need to be deep and the reamer shafts need to be small so that basically you avoid using something that's more like a plunger. This uh, one here on the left is the standard AO uh, reamer, and this is, this is the worst one. You see that the flutes are very shallow, and there's very little difference between the flute diameter and the shaft diameter. This, um, this one here is much better where it has deeper flutes,
and a much smaller shaft diameter, so the, the marrow products and the, can you know, pass along the, the, the as you're reaming rather than being plunged into the bloodstream. Uh, if you have a patient that has that you know preoperatively has bilateral pneumothoraces, a flail chest, you know, bilateral pulmonary contusions, that might be the one indication where you could consider or should consider doing an unreamed technique for femoral nailing. Now, open femoral shaft fractures, of course, uh, warrant emergent surgical debridement. Again, reamed nailing uh, is the preferred treatment, so just because the fracture is open does not mean that you uh, abandon the preference for reaming. Um, you want to uh, perform delayed wound closure or soft tissue management as you would for all open fractures, and the end results of these injuries are basically comparable to the results reported for closed fractures if the treatment principles are followed for management of the open fracture wound. What about gunshot femur fractures, uh, low velocity handgun injuries, immediate ream nailing is the treatment of choice. If you have very high velocity injuries such as this shotgun blast seen here, which have concomitant significant soft tissue injury, then that may be an indication for external fixation as I mentioned early, get the wound uh, under control and then later convert to an intramedullary nail. The ipsilateral neck and shaft fracture, remember that the neck fracture can be missed um, it's important to recognize it preoperatively so that you can plan how you want to take care of it. Um, the neck fracture is given priority in treatment, of course, because we believe that an anatomical reduction of the femoral neck is essential to prevent the complications of nonunion and osteonecrosis, as we've already covered. There are several different options for treatment. Um, they're listed here. I would ask you to please forget about the first two. The antegrade nail with screws placed anterior to the nail, yes, it can be done, but it's technically a very difficult procedure. There are all kinds of implants that can have come out on the market that have subsequently been pulled that simply don't work to allow you to address this. You you could also um, um, actually, um, I, I meant to forget the first one and the last one. The last one, the list there, the second generation of recon nail is a very poor choice for treatment. Yeah, it, it can theoretically work, but you, again, that does not allow you to give the proper priority to the neck fracture, which is what you should do. You're basically relying on the fracture of the neck remaining non-displaced as you pass your femoral nail and then when you place your, place your proximal screws into the femoral neck and head. So the treatment of choice really for ipsilateral neck shaft fractures is either using multiple screws for the neck and a plate or multiple screws for the neck and a retrograde nail. Either one of those techniques will work very well. Complications of femoral shaft fractures, well, we've already mentioned that infection is quite rare, less than 1%. If it does happen, the treatment is to remove the nail, ream the canal to get rid of the infection. If the fracture is not healed, you may need to place an external fixator. If you have a delayed union, you can consider doing dynamization of the nail by removing either the proximal or distal interlocking screws, plus or minus bone grafting. And if you have an established non-union of a femoral shaft fracture, the treatment of choice of that would be reamed exchange nailing. Complications of femoral shaft fractures, if you do the uh, case with a, on a fracture table with traction to the extremity, there is about a 10% reported incidence of pudendal nerve palsy. It's not something that we typically ask for. Um, I think most commonly uh, we're doing these fractures now with, without using a fracture table, so that's really probably less common than it is been reported in the literature. Heterotopic ossification is the most frequent complication of femoral shaft fractures and occurs in up to 25% of the time. However, fortunately, it's rarely clinically significant. Complications also include malunion. Uh, the pro if you nail the patient in the supine position, uh, there's a tendency to nail the patient in too much internal rotation. That's if you're doing a piriformis fossa starting point because you're trying to you know, rotate the hemipelvis to get to the piriformis fossa. You can, tend to, you can tend to miss an internal rotation. On the other hand, if you're doing the patient in the lateral position, you can tend to miss with too much external rotation. If you nail the patient with traction, if you have too much traction, you can nail the patient too long. If you do the patient without traction and there's a very common due to fracture, uh, quite common to nail the patient too short. So, Although the success rate of treatment of femoral shaft fractures is quite high, there are some, there is, is, it's not something that should be done necessarily by the most junior person in, in your team, and really you need to pay attention to the details. What you really want to avoid is a post-operative x-ray like this where you've got an AP of the proximal femur and a lateral of the distal femur. I think this was Dr. Mullis's x-ray, if I'm not mistaken. Just kidding. Um, distal femur fractures. Um, are the result of high energy trauma in young patients and typically present with significant displacement. If you have an older patient, uh, there's less displacement, but you're dealing with osteoporotic bone, so that creates some therapeutic uh, dilemma for you. 
The distal femur is defined as the five centimeters above the metaphyseal flare extending to the articular surfaces. We also classify them as supracondylar, meaning that there's no intraarticular fracture extension, or intercondylar, meaning there is intraarticular fracture extension. And in the OTA compendium, these are 33 A, B, or C injuries. Remember that for all periarticular fractures, an A injury is an extraarticular fracture that does not extend to the joint, a B is a partial articular fracture, and a C is a complete articular fracture where no portion of the articular surfaces are in continuity with the shaft of the bone. Um, with significantly displaced distal femur fractures, there's a high energy for potential, uh, or high, high potential for injury to the popliteal artery. Um, if you have no pulses, after you have reestablished gross alignment to the extremity, then arteriography is indicated. So the first thing to do would be to pull traction in line with the extremity, reestablish gross alignment, Recheck your pulses. If the pulses don't come back, that patient needs to go for uh, angiography or potentially immediately to the operating room. For non-displaced fractures, uh, cast bracing uh, can be used. You want to keep the patient non-weight bearing for approximately six weeks, and you want to allow them to immediately move the knee joint. So a hinged knee brace would be the treatment of choice in the, in the majority of these situations. For displaced fractures, the treatment principles are to obtain an anatomical reduction of the joint surface, typically with lag screws across the condyles of the distal femur. Then you want to do some sort of construct to obtain stable fixation of the articular segment of the bone to the shaft of the bone. And in doing that, you have to preserve the vascularity of your fracture fragments, and you want to get stable fixation so that you can move the knee joint early. But what are the options for accomplishing those goals? Well, there's the, the fixed angle plate devices, such as the 95 degree blade plate or the DCS. This is an example of a dynamic condor screw used for a distal femur fracture. And there are, of course, new in implants that have come out in the last few years, such as the LIS, the less invasive stabilization system, and the locking compression plates that can be used to treat these fractures. You can use a non-fixed angle plate, but again, I would argue that in 2005, the indications for this technique now is, are quite rare, or you can do an interlocked retrograde intramedullary nail for supracondylar fracture patterns. Fixed angle plate devices are the most stable construct and have been associated in the literature with union rates in the mid-90s. Remember that if you're going to place a blade, you need two centimeters of intact distal femur for the blade. If you're doing a dynamic condor screw, you need four centimeters of intact distal femur. These fractures do allow you to obtain direct reduction via a lateral approach, and with the more recent locked plating techniques, you can do these even through percutaneous uh, plating procedures. Um, with the, with a, fr a, frac a coronal fracture, a split in the coronal plane, the, the blade plate and DCS may be contraindicated. The non-fixed angle plating, um, basically the condylar buttress plate, which you see di diagrammatically represented here. This plate, I would submit to you, is basically of historical significance only at this time. Um, it may be indicated in very severely comminuted fractures that have extension in through, have a con a associated coronal plane fracture. In other words, a fracture that separates the medial condyle of the distal femur from the lateral condyle. That may be the one indication where this plate will be indicated. Um, the problem with this plate is that it's not a fixed angle construct, and these fractures typically go into varus malalignment by collapse of this medial cortex. And that's something that you may see on your test testing that what's the complication with treatment of these fractures with this type of implant. So if you're using this type of technique, you may consider using a second medial buttress plate on a delayed basis. You wouldn't necessarily want to do it acutely because of the risk of creating a dead bone sandwich. Or you can consider bone grafting if you have no medial bony support. Now what about retrograde IM nailing um, can be very useful for supracondylar fractures that are non-comminuted. Um, if you have very osteoporotic bone, uh, this, is a, this is a good technique, or in periprosthetic fractures uh, in which the um, total knee arthroplasty implant will allow you access to the intramedullary canal, this has also been shown to be a, a very good implant. In comparison to the fixed angle plate devices, it does give you less axial and rotational stability, however. And also there's the issue of knee pain postoperatively. All right, knee dislocations are the result of a high energy mechanism. They typically have significant soft tissue disruption. In order to completely dislocate the knee joint, three, at least three of the four primary, primary ligamentous restraints of the knee must be disrupted. And remember that knee dislocations are probably underdiagnosed because it's estimated that up to 50% of them will present with the joint reduced. There's a high instance of associated injuries, uh, vascular injuries, up to 30% of the time. If you look specifically at anterior-posterior dislocations, 
50% of those will have some vascular injury. Neurologic injuries are also quite common, specifically damage to the perineal uh, nerve up to 23% of the time. The classification scheme is quite simple. Anterior and posterior dislocations are the most common. You can also have a medial dislocation or a lateral or even more rarely a, a rotatory or posterior lateral type of dislocation. It's very important when you see a patient with a knee dislocation as, a patient, as the same for a patient with a distal femur fracture that you rule out vascular injury. You have to be thinking about it in order to rule it out, of course. And what we're looking for are the presence of absence of both hard and soft signs. The hard signs consist of absent pulses, active bleeding, expanding hematoma, brewy, or thrill. Those are things you need to remember. The soft signs of vascular injury consist of diminished pulses, de decreased capillary refill, hypesthesias, or coolness or power of the leg. The, also, the ankle brachial index can be important. Uh, it's, it's obtained by Doppler evaluation. And remember that a normal ankle brachial index is greater than 0 0.9. If the ABI is less than 0 0.9, that should be considered a sign of vascular injury. The treatment of knee dislocations, these are considered an orthopedic emergency. The joint has to be reduced as soon as possible, and the treatment algorithm would be to reduce the knee and then re-examine the neurovascular status of the extremity, specifically looking for both neurologic and vascular injury. And if you suspect vascular injury, of course, it's very important to uh, get your vascular team uh, mobilized as early as possible. If there's vascular injury present, if there are hard signs, again, absent pulses, uh, active bleeding, expanding hematoma, brewy thrills. There's no indication for a preoperative arteriogram. You, the, the vascular surgeon is going to know where the injury is. That patient needs to go to the operating room and undergo exploration and revascularization of the limb. If there are soft signs postoperatively, then you can consider a preoperative arteriogram, you know, in consultation with your vascular specialist, and that's where you can look for uh, more occult type injuries that may or may not require revascularization. If revascularization, revascularization is necessary, it should be done within six hours uh, because the extremity can really only tolerate six hours of warm ischemia. You typically use a reverse saphenous vein graft to bypass the area of injury. And always remember that fasciotomies should be performed after vascular repair in the extremities. It never ceases to amaze me how many of our vascular surgical colleagues do not understand that concept. And this came up in our institution just this week. So remember that uh, often you may be the one to advocate and even perform the fasciotomies in these cases. Ligamentous injury and repair. Um, again, we expect that there's ligamentous injury. The primary ligamentous restraints are invariably disrupted with these types of injuries. There are several treatment options. You can treat them non-surgically. Uh, you can do an acute repair defined as any time within three weeks of the injury, or you can do a late repair after three weeks of injury, and that would be after the patient has regained motion to the joint. Um, if you're going to do a ligamentous repair, it's most important to repair the posterior capsule, which consists of the PCL as well as, as, well as the posterior lateral corner. Those are the structures that we believe are the most important to be uh, reconstructed. Um, augmentation and substitution is often necessary as it's very un unusual that you can repair these uh, injured structures primarily. And remember that the medial collateral ligament is the one primary ligament strain of the knee that can usually be effectively treated non-operatively. The ACL is a little bit uh, controversial. Now, complications of knee dislocations are quite frequent. These are in no way normal knees uh, after they've been treated. The most common complication by far is stiffness, which is somewhat ironic considering the fact that they're so unstable when they first present. And also remember that there's a 23% incidence of neurologic injury, which can lead to some long-term complications with the patient as well. All right, we'll move on down. To, uh, to patella fractures uh, typically occur as a direct blow to the anterior knee. Remember that the patella is a true sesamoid bone contained within the quadriceps mechanism proximally and the patellar ligament distally. Also remember that the distal pole of the patella, which represents 30% of the length of the bone, is extraarticular, and that has some important treatment implications. The physical examination of the patient with a patella fracture is critical because if the patient has is unable to actively extend the knee joint, that is your clinical evidence of a significant extensor mechanism injury to the knee. So that's what you're looking for. The patient has to be able to extend the knee joint actively in order for you to consider treating the patient non-operatively.
imaging. You want an AP x-ray, a lateral uh, to look for your transverse fracture patterns, and the sunrise view such as this can sometimes be useful to look at vertical fracture patterns. The classification of patella fractures is, uh, is a functional one and consists of transverse fractures, as you see here, vertical fractures, or comminuted or stellate fractures. And it's a very simple classification scheme. Um, Non-displaced versus displaced. Well, how much displacement can we accept? Basically, the literature would support that you can accept up to three centimeters of fragment diastasis or fragment separation and up to two millimeters of articular surface displacement. So this is a perfect example of a fracture that could be effectively treated treated non-operatively, there's relatively minimal fragment diastasis and no significant displacement if this patient has an intact extensor mechanism. You have to make sure that you verify that on your, on your clinical exam. Non-surgical treatment is indicated for non-displaced fractures that meet the criteria that I mentioned. Minimally displaced fractures with an intact extensor mechanism. You can use a hinge knee brace for four to six weeks. You can allow them to weight bear as tolerated, typically with the brace locked in full extension. Surgical treatment is the accepted treatment for the majority of displaced fractures. You can consider doing either a primary open reduction and internal fixation, or you can do a partial patellectomy. The treatment principles are that you should preserve as much of the patella as you can whenever possible. And remember that there is no role for performing a complete patellectomy. That is a very, leads to a very poor result. ORIF is typically performed with the anterior tension band technique. You can use either K-wires or cannulated screws to longitudinally to realign the primary fracture fragments and then use uh, a wire anteriorly to, as a tension band, which again allows you to harness dynamic uh, forces across the knee joint to uh, obtain interfragmentary compression. Partial patellectomy is a good procedure for extra articular distal pole fractures. This is a perfect example here of a patient that has a distal pole fracture. This patient's extensor mechanism is clearly going to be disrupted. They have a significant uh, high riding patella here. And you see this very distal pole fracture. This is extra articular. That bone can be excised um, and the patellar ligament can be reattached. Now, when the patellar ligament is reattached, it's important to remember that you want to reattach the patellar ligament anteriorly, not posteriorly. It seems intuitively obvious that you'd want to reattach the patellar ligament posteriorly, but this study that was in the journal and back in about 10 years ago really demonstrated that by attaching the patellar ligament anteriorly leads to um, a, a tilting force and increased patellar femoral compressive forces proximally in the trochlea. So you want to reattach the patellar ligament anteriorly. This is the reference if anybody has any questions about that. Now, open fractures of the patella should be treated as a closed fracture once you have done your uh, emergent and thorough surgical debridement. So in other words, you can proceed with immediate internal fixation in these cases and has been shown to lead to acceptable results. Complications of patella fractures, the most common complication is symptomatic hardware. You can imagine with a construct like this, although you've got very stable uh, you know, anatomical alignment of the fracture fragments, these wires often are quite prominent and that's something that needs to be discussed with the patient preoperatively as, as along with the potential need for removal of the implants once the fracture is healed. Now, loss of reduction in patella fractures had been, has been reported in up to 20% of cases, and both technical errors, mistakes made by the surgeons, as well as patient noncompliance have been implicated. Nonunions are quite rare, less than 5%. Patellar dislocations um, typically occur in adolescents and young adults. You reduce them by you know, uh, gently placing the knee into full extension. And remember that as with shoulder dislocations, there's a very high re-dislocation rate with these injuries. And the problem with these prob is that you have damage to the medial patellofemoral ligament. Um, that's the structure that you need to remember. You also should know that there have been studies that look, have looked at immediate repair of these patients and has not been shown to be associated with a, an increased uh, or a more successful treatment result. So there's really no indication for immediate exploration and repair of the medial patellofemoral ligament in these cases. Patellar ligament rupture occur in active adult patients, typically less than 40 years old. And again, this is in contrast to quad tendon ruptures, which I'll cover in just a moment. Patellar tendonitis or jumper's knee is considered to be a risk factor for a later development of patellar ligament rupture. The clinical, clinical and radiographic finding is a high riding patella or patella alta. And what happens typically is avulsion of the patellar ligament from the distal pole of the patella. The treatment is direct primary repair using non-absorbable sutures. You can do it either through patellar drill holes or, as in this case, with suture anchors. You also can consider supplementing your fixation uh, with a surclage wire or tape. You see in this case I've 
placed a, a, a drill hole here in the anterior aspect of the proximal tibia and used a, um, a mercelline tape or something like that to supplement my fixation. Uh, now, in contrast, quad tendon ruptures are much more common than patellar ligament ruptures, and they also occur in older patients, typically older than age 40, and patients that have typically medical comorbidities. The, the quintessential or classic case is the renal transplant patient, for example, that will present with a quad tendon rupture. Um, you'd think that the diagnosis would usually be uh, obvious, but sometimes it can be quite difficult uh, because a portion of the, of the quad can remain intact to the patella. Um, and again, in, com in contrast to patellar ligament ruptures, which typically are avulsions directly off the bone, quad tendon ruptures typically are intrasubstance tears of the tendon, usually about two centimeters proximal to the proximal pole. The treatment is surgical repair if the patient cannot actively extend the knee joint. So again, the inability to actively extend the knee is, in is indicative of a, of a clinically significant extensor mechanism injury, and that patient needs surgical repair. You do an end-to-end -end primary repair. You do not need to supplement with a cerclage. And it's important that you, you diagnose and treat these patients early because definitely worse results have been reported with delayed or late repair of these injuries. All right. Moving on down to the tibia now, the in mechanism of injury for tibial plateau fractures is either a varus valgus loading injury or a varus valgus load with concomitant um, axial compression. These fractures, interestingly, have a bimodal distribution in males. They're at the peak incidence is in the fourth decade, and of course, these are the, our trauma patients. In females, the peak incidence is in the seventh decade, and these are the old lady uh, osteoporotic falls. We classify them as either unicondylar or bicondylar, and in terms of the uh, frequency, lateral plateau fractures are the most common, followed by bicondylar fractures, and medial plateau fractures are the least common. Um, associated injuries are quite common with these. It's been reported that up to 50% of them have some associated soft tissue trauma, meniscal tears in 47%, for example, medial collateral ligament tears, quite common, anterior cruciate ligament injuries, also common, and compartment syndromes. Never fail to think about the possibility of a compartment syndrome in a patient with a closed proximal tibia fracture, particularly a pedestrian type, a pedestrian versus motor vehicle type injury. The Schatzker classification, a Schatzker 1 is a split fracture, a Schatzker 2 is a split depressed fracture, which is a quite common uh, fracture of the lateral plateau, a 3 is a pure depression fracture, which is quite rare actually, a type 4 is a medial plateau fracture, and medial plateau fractures are, are significant in that they're relatively uncommon, but when they do, when you do see them, they are always are an indication of very high energy trauma to the knee and they always require surgical treatment. Uh, the five and six are the bicondylar fractures, with the six being the one where you have complete dissociation of the articular segment of the bone from the shaft of the bone. The AOOTA classification, the tibia is the fourth bone. The proximal segment of that bone makes these 41 fractures, A, extra articular, B, partial articular, C, complete articular. Imaging AP lateral and oblique plane films are useful, and then CT scan is also often quite useful in these fractures to identify the presence or absence of articular depression, how much comminution is there of the fracture, and to assist you in your preoperative planning. So I will almost routinely get uh, CT scans on patients with tibial plateau fractures for these reasons. Non-operative treatment is indicated for patients that have less than three millimeters of articular displacement and in patients that have a stable knee to clinical examination with a stable knee being defined as less than 10 degrees of varus valgus instability um, with your examination. Now, of course, this is reported in the literature, but it's often quite difficult to do this examination in a patient with an acute tibial plateau fracture. So often you have to rely more heavily on your radiographic criteria. If you have a patient that you're going to consider non-operative treatment, you can treat them with a hinge knee brace with early range of motion of the joint and uh, protected weight bearing. Operative indications, if you have articular step-off uh, greater than three millimeters, if you have condylar widening greater than five millimeters. This is an example of a patient with significant condylar widening. When you get the CT of this patient, you'll see this patient really has a split depressed fracture that you can't really appreciate very well on this plane film, but you can see the, the split component of the fracture. So remember that the most lateral aspect of the lateral plateau should not project more laterally than the most lateral aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. So this patient really does have a significant split fracture. And then all medial plateau fractures and all bicondylar fractures should be considered for surgical intervention in the absence of other medical contraindications. Plate fixation has the benefit of allowing you to obtain direct anatomical reduction. 
You can get rigid fixation. It's very useful for unicondylar fractures, the isolated uh, lateral or medial plateau fractures. Uh, we prefer to do it through small incisions. Um, if you're going to, you know, you could, you need to consider the possibility of doing it through a midline incision to potentially avoid compromising a later reconstructive procedure to the knee, or you can do it through a more smaller, you know, lateral type in, uh, uh, incision for this type of technique and also with using percutaneous plating techniques. Um, the problem historically with plate fixation of bicondylar fractures is that there is a, a very high instance of complications because of inability to respect the soft tissues. And what happened in this case is there's an, a long uh, anterior midline longitudinal incision is made, the bone stripped immediately, the stripped laterally, dual plates are placed, and this is the dreaded dead bone sandwich. And you especially want to avoid the Mercedes or the Y incision uh, in treating these fractures. The principle is you really want to be thinking about later reconstructive options when you're making incisions around the knee joint. Now, new percutaneous techniques and implants are available, again, such as the list and the locking compression plate that have really sort of revolutionized our treatment of tibial plateau fractures. They're very useful in bicondylar fractures and allow you to basically as, uh, to perform sort of a, an internal external fixation, if you will, to place a fixed angle construct to use your standard principles to anatomically reduce your joint surface and then get stable fixation of the joint segment to the shaft of the bone. Um, and this has been shown to be associated with a decreased incidence of soft tissue complications. Now, external fixation still can, is used in, uh, in many cases for bicondylar fractures. It has the benefit of allowing you to uh, minimally insult the soft tissues proximally. You can obviously place these thin wires percutaneously and do limited uh, incision techniques for reducing the joint surface. Um, so you're losing limited open or percutaneous fixation of the articular segment and then using the fixator to neutralize the, the articular segment of the bone to the shaft of the bone. You can do it through a unilateral half pin fixator. You can do a standard Ilazar off thin wire fixator or a hybrid ring type application such as shown here where you have thin wires proximally and half pins distally. Or you can use a bridging frame and, and bridging external fixation for the knee joint is useful in certain instances in tibial plateau fractures. The hybrid ring fixator, again, the fixator is used to stabilize the metaphysis to the diaphysis. It does allow you to get early motion of the knee joint. In the literature, it is associated with 80% good to excellent results. Remember that when you're placing thin wires in the proximal tibia, you have to keep your thin wires at least 14 millimeters away from the joint because of the capsular reflection. If you're closer to the joint than that, you run the risk of uh, causing uh, uh, knee sepsis. Now, bridging external fixation is intended as temporary stabilization for a patient with a tibial plateau fracture. It's rarely indicated for definitive management of the fracture because, of course, the uh, need to immobilize the knee joint. But in certain situations, it can be very helpful to allow you to temporarily restore the length, the angular, and the rotational alignment of the bone. You also, through the principle of ligament ataxis, by applying the distraction force across the knee joint, can indirectly affect reduction of the articular segments of the bone. So the indications for this technique would be the patient with severe soft tissue trauma, such as here's a patient with multiple fracture blisters, severe uh, proximal tibia soft tissue injury where you want to avoid making any incisions, put the external fixator on, get the soft tissue to heal, and then go back later and do your definitive treatment. Also in the polytraumatized patient where you might not be able to take that patient to the operating room for a period of time. Again, damage control orthopedics. This would be an excellent indication in a patient with an unstable proximal tibia fracture to put an external fixer across the joint, um, you've immobilized the extremity, you've stabilized the fracture, then go back once the patient is medically stable and do your definitive fracture treatment. Outcomes for tibial plateau fractures, there's no question that there is an increased risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and you really need to follow these patients long-term because you may not see the effects of it for up to five to seven years post-injury. If the patient has significant ligaments and stability associated with their fracture, that's associated with a worse result, and also patients that have been treated with meniscectomy have a worse result. So meniscectomy is, is, is not indicated. Tibial shaft fractures. Fracture of the tibia shaft is the most common long bone fracture. There's a very wide spectrum of injury, which ranges from the um, you know, soccer player that has a very simple, minimally displaced torsion injury to this a case such as this, which is the mangled extremity. Um, so they can be either a result of low energy trauma or high energy trauma. And the, 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 the most critical factor in determining the outcome of tibial shaft fractures really is the associated soft tissue trauma. Low energy fractures are typically the result of a torsional injury, will present with spiral fracture patterns, they're indirect trauma, 
you'll see that the fibula is typically fractured at a different level, either proximally or distally relative to the location of the tibial shaft fracture. And these are the patients that will have closed fractures with uh, churning, zero, or grade one soft tissue injury, insignificant soft tissue injury. On the other end of the spectrum are the high energy fractures, which are typically the result of direct forces, a direct blow to the tibia, significant bony comminution, the fibula is going to be fractured at the same level as the tibia, and you'll have severe soft tissue injury. These are the fractures that are going to be open, or you're going to have churning two or three closed soft tissue injuries. Closed fractures, treatment options consist of cast immobilization, IM nailing, or external fixation. We'll talk a little bit about each of those. Cast immobilization is still probably uh, indicated for low energy fractures in which you can obtain and maintain an acceptable reduction. I'll talk about what the criteria are for acceptable reduction. The, the treatment is you do a closed reduction, then you place the patient into a long leg cast, and then you convert the patient early from a long leg cast to a functional brace. And that should be done at about four weeks. If you can obtain and maintain acceptable alignment of the tibial shaft, then this type of closed treatment has been shown to be associated with very high success rate. Now, what are the criteria for acceptable alignment? You have to have less than five degrees of angulation in the coronal plane uh, with varus valgus angulation, less than 10 degrees of angulation in the sagittal plane. You need to have at least 50% cortical apposition of your primary proximal and distal shaft fragments. You, have, you must have less than one centimeter of shortening, and you have to have rotational alignment within 10 degrees. If all these criteria exist, then you can consider closed cast treatment of a tibial shaft fracture. Now, what about intramedullary nailing? What are the indications? Well, if you can not obtain an acceptable alignment or if you cannot maintain an acceptable alignment with closed treatment, then that would be an indication for IM nailing. If you have significant soft tissue injury where you don't want to place the patient into a cast and you will need to be able to evaluate the soft tissue wounds, that would be an indication for uh, IM nailing. Segmental fractures, there's no indication for closed treatment uh, or, uh, not, or not, not operative treatment of a segmental fracture. Ipsilateral limb injuries where you're going to be treating the patient for, for other fractures in the same limb polytraumatized patients, bilateral tibia fractures in the patient who's morbidly obese. These are all patients that are not going to do well with cast treatment of a tibial shaft fracture. So the, so the IM nailing is, should be considered the treatment of choice for high energy fractures and those that are unstable. Um, if you can, in these fractures, displaced fractures, if you compare IM nailing to closed cast treatment, IM nailing is associated with a decreased time to union and an increased union rate. Um, just as with the femur, when you're doing an IM nailing, statically interlock both proximally and distally. Again, there's no indication acutely for dynamic interlocking intermedullary nailing in the lower extremity. What about ream versus unream for closed fractures? Well, reaming again has the uh, theoretical uh, concern of damage to the endosteal blood supply. However, the clinical results of reaming have been shown to be superior to the results for unream. So, Closed fractures, reaming is the way to go. Reaming is associated with increased union rate, decreased time to union, and a decreased hardware failure. You know, when you're doing an unreamed technique, you're typically putting in a smaller diameter nail with smaller diameter locking screws, and those are the nails and, and locking screws that have been shown to break. Complications of IM nailing, anterior knee pain is the most common complication of IM nailing of a tibial shaft fracture. The instance has been said to be as much as 50%. It has been shown to be higher with a patellar tendon splitting approach as opposed to a medial parapatellar arthrotomy. Um, and also you should remember that the um, instance of knee pain has been not, not been shown to be associated with whether the nail is prominent radiographically or not. And also, once you take the nail out, the results are a little bit unpredictable. Basically, about a third of them will get complete relief of their symptoms, a third will be a little better, and a third will have no relief after the nail is removed. Now, remember the proximal third tibial shaft fracture. These are fractures that notoriously cause complications with nailing. There's a very high incidence of valgus and procurvatum malalignment. This is a case uh, here of significant procurvatum. Uh, the problem is this nail was not placed uh, in proper fashion. The technique of insertion is critically important in these, in these proximal third fractures. Your nail must go in exactly parallel to the lateral cortex in your coronal plane image and to the anterior cortex in your sagittal plane image. You also should consider using blocking screws and or a unicortical plate 
um, uh, to, to hold the fracture redu in reduced while you're passing your nail. So just beware the complications with the proximal third tibial shaft fractures. Now what about external fixation for, for closed tibial shaft fractures? Well, there's really very few indications, but in certain cases where you have very proximal or distal metaphyseal fractures, external fixation can sometimes be useful. Um, however, pin tract infections are quite common. And in comparison to I am nailing, there is a higher incidence of malunion um, which you need to take into account. Now, what about open tibial shaft fractures? Well, remember that the most important step in the treatment of an open tibial shaft fracture is emergent and thorough debridement. You have to remove all devitalized tissue, including cortical bone, if necessary. You're not doing the patient any favors by leaving devascularized bone in the wound. You know, we'll do what we need to do to reconstruct the soft tissues, and we have techniques available to us to reconstruct bony defects. So all devitalized tissues, including bone, must be removed, and that's the most important factor in determining the outcome of an open tibial shaft fracture. Now, for the definitive treatment of the bony injury, what about external fixation versus I am nailing? Um, external fixation has a little bit fallen out of favor in, in the last decade or so. However, it's important for you to understand that in the literature, in, comparison, in comparing these two, two techniques, there's no difference in either the infection rate, the union rate, or the time to union with X fix versus I am nailing. The areas where I am nailing has been shown to be superior are in decreased incidence of malalignment decreased incidence of secondary surgeries and shorter time to weight bearing. So there, I think there's a common misconception that an external fixator on an open tibial shaft fracture will not lead to successful union of the bone. The bone will heal, uh, and that's been shown in the literature, but you, you may heal in malalignment, and it may take longer for it to heal. Open fractures, what about unream versus ream nailing? This is another um, topic that was, you know, when I was a resident you know, 10 years ago or so, this is another very hot topic that I believe has been resolved now. It's still a little bit controversial, but recent studies really do suggest that there's no adverse effect of reaming. When I was a resident, all open fractures were treated with an unreamed nail. You know, now I basically ream all, op all open tibial shaft fractures because the clinical studies have not shown either higher incidence of infection or higher incidence of non-union with reamed uh, insertion techniques. Uh, also, as with um, um, uh, close fractures, unream techniques have been shown with, to be associated with an increased incidence of hardware failure. So ream technique is, is probably the preferred, pre preferred treatment for most open tibial shaft fractures. Now what about limb salvage and open tibial shaft fractures? Remember that there's no current available clinical scoring system that can be used in and of itself to determine whether an extremity should be salvaged or amputated. For example, the MESS score cannot be used alone. Um, relative indications for amputation, and again, I want to emphasize that these are relative indications, consist of warm ischemia greater than six hours, absent plantar sensation, which would be indicative of uh, significant damage to the tibial nerve, and severe ipsilateral foot trauma. Those are things you would look for that might push you towards an immediate amputation. The LEAP study, um, remember that the, one, the most important finding to come out of that study is that there's really no significant difference in the functional outcome long term between patients treated with salvage versus patients treated with amputation. Uh, Non-union of tibial shaft fractures is defined uh, at uh, non-healing past nine months. We consider delayed unions at uh, anywhere from six to nine months, the treatment options. If your fracture is axially stable, then you can dynamize the tibial nail by removing either the proximal or distal interlocking screws. If the fracture is not axially, axially stable, then an exchange nailing is indicated, a reamed exchange nailing. If you have significant bone loss, you probably need to place that bone with a bone grafting procedure, and you can also consider non-invasive means such as electrical stimulation and ultrasound. There are proponents of those and studies that are reported in the literature. Now what about compartment syndrome and tibial shaft fractures? The incidence occurs anywhere from 1 to 9 percent. Um, it can occur with both closed and open fractures. I predict that each one of you at some point will see a compartment syndrome in a patient that has an open tibial shaft fracture. So don't just assume that because the fracture is open that the compartments are adequately decompressed. The most important factor in, in uh, treating and diagnosing and treating a compartment syndrome, of course, is to have a high index of clinical suspicion. Remember that failure to diagnose and treat compartment syndrome remains in 2005 the most common reason for successful malpractice litigation against orthopedic surgeons. So don't let it happen to you.
It's important from your understanding of the mechanism of injury that the patient sustained that you are thinking about the possibility of a compartment syndrome. The clinical findings that you look for, the, the uh, one that's said to be the most sensitive is pain with passive stretch. Um, the, most sens the most sensitive indicator is a compartment pressure within 30 millimeters of, the di 30 millimeters of mercury of the diastolic blood pressure, the so-called delta P. So if you take your compartment pressure measurement with your striker or whatever technique you're using, and that measurement is within 30 millimeters of the diastolic blood pressure, that patient has an indication for fasciotomies. And, of course, the treatment of compartment syndrome is emergent fasciotomy. Now, complications of tibial shaft fractures, again, the most common is, is a knee pain. Ankle stiffness can also occur, um, knee pain, particularly with uh, intramedullary nailing. Moving on down, we're going to get to the, the distal tibia now and talk about plafond fractures. Plafond fractures are the result of high energy trauma with, through an axial load mechanism. There's the, these fractures are characterized by significant articular impaction, significant comminution, uh, also, significant associated soft tissue injury, which is a very important factor in, in determining how they should be treated, metaphyseal bone loss, and also other injuries to the musculoskeletal system. Tibial plafond fractures is no question that we're seeing these more commonly in our trauma centers, not perhaps because they're occurring more frequently, but because with airbags and EMS systems and, um, and seat belt use that these patients are surviving their trauma and, and getting to our trauma centers, and, and we're seeing these more for that reason. Displacement is the rule with these injuries. It's very unusual after a motor vehicle accident to have a patient with a, a non-displaced tibial plafond fracture. Remember that three-fourths of them will have an associated fracture of the distal fibula, and that has important treatment implications. And remember that all of these patients do have soft tissue injury. Either the fracture will be over open or they'll have significant churning two or three type soft tissue injury. The imaging, AP lateral and mortise plane films of the ankle as well as a CT scan. Just as with fra articular fractures of the proximal tibia, we're looking for articular comminution, identifying our fracture fragments and fracture orientation and planning surgical approaches and reduction maneuvers. The Rudy and Allgauer classification system for these is uh, something that's in the literature. Type 1 fractures are minimally or non-displaced. I don't see those in my practice. Type 2 fractures are the displaced fractures where there's relatively minimal displacement and three of the fractures that are typically have uh, more articular displacement and comminution. Most of the fractures it seems that we see in North America are type 3 fractures. The AOOTA, uh, 43A, B, and C, as with other, uh, other uh, extreme periarticular fractures. Surgery is indicated for displaced fractures of the tibial plafond. Your options consist of ORIF, external fixation, or external fixation in combination with limited internal fixation techniques. This is the standard uh, AO technique, if you will, for treatment of an intraarticular fracture of the distal tibia. The first step is to reduce and plate the fibula to establish the, um, the length of the lateral column of the ankle mortise, if you will. The second step is to anatomically reduce and fix the joint uh, surfaces to obtain anatomical reduction, and then the third step would be to apply either a medial or an anterior buttress plate to stabilize the articular segment of the bone to the shaft of the bone. Now, the benefit of this technique is that it does allow you to get anatomical reduction, of course, if it's done properly. You can get rigid fixation with uh, using this type of medial buttress plate, and you can immediately move the ankle joint. However, the problem with uh, ORF, or, or traditional plate fixation, I should say, is that it has been shown to be associated with a very high instance of potentially disastrous soft tissue complications. And this is, again, due to failure to properly respect the soft tissue component of these injuries. When you're performing uh, internal fixation procedures around the ankle joint, it's very important to keep your your skin flaps as thick as possible. You must obtain a seven centimeter, seven centimeter bridge between your skin incisions. And I think it's been definitively shown now that there's basically zero indication for acute plate fixation of these high energy fractures. And so what do you do with them? Well, we'll talk about that now. So there have been improved results reported basically with use of a staged protocol. Application of a temporary bridging external fixator across the ankle joint with minimal to no additional soft tissue insult, a couple of tibial shaft half pins, uh, uh, either a, a fixation pins, half pins in the hind foot distally, either the calcaneus or the, in the talus, or a simple transfixion pin through the calcaneus, a simple fixation frame across the ankle joint to allow your soft tissues to heal, then you can go back and do your definitive uh, fixation, and that would typically be done at anywhere from 10 to 14 days or so once the skin wrinkles return and you think it's safe to proceed. 
If you're going to do an ORAF, we would prefer to do it through small incisions, using indirect reduction methods, and using lower profile implants. This is the typical type of incision that I would use. Here's the fibula here. This is the, the standard anterolateral fragment associated with these fractures, making a small incision just to hinge open this fragment, look at the joint segment, you know, reduce it with indirect reduction techniques, you know, place some lag screws percutaneously, and then use my external fixator on the medial side of the ankle for, for buttress, buttressing the fixation, such as you see here. So external fixation has the benefit of avoiding additional injury to the soft tissues, which are already significantly compromised. It can be used in combination with limited open or percutaneous internal fixation techniques. You can use a spanning external fixer, such as seen here. You can use a hybrid ring fixator, although I've gone away from that in these, in these injuries. Or you can use an articulated fixator. Um, so external fixation has a decreased incidence of wound complications and deep infection compared to ORIF, and this has been looked at in, uh, in prospective studies, actually, uh, X-fix with uh, limited ORIF versus plate fixation for these fractures. Um, with use of non-spanning fixers, the one theoretical benefit to putting a hybrid ring type fixator on this type of fracture pattern with thin wires in the distal tibial metaphyseal segment would be that you can move the ankle joint. That has not been shown to, however, lead to increased ankle motion long term. The complications of external fixation, of course, pin and wire tract infections as with, as with any external fixator application. You can also get impalement of the neurovascular structures if these wires are not placed judiciously, and you can get loss of ankle motion. This is the problem that I'm talking about. You know, we've done plenty of these cases where the patient, uh, what happens is the patient ends up with a, an ankle that's stiff, but it's stiff in equinus versus being stiff in a functional position, a plantigrade position, if you had placed the patient in a, in a spanning external fixator. Complications of plafond fractures, wound slough uh, ten, up to 10%, and again, that's with injudicious use of, of ORF techniques. Deep infection uh, can occur up to 35% of the time in similar situations. You can get a varus malunion. You can get nonunion at the, at the distal metadaphyseal junction. That's actually quite common and typically can be treated with uh, bone grafting and plate fixation. And post-traumatic arthrosis would be the most common complication. And these plafond fractures typically will do worse than... Uh, plateau fractures, for example. You can, the patients can really tolerate more articular incongruity of the proximal tibia than they can of the distal tibia. This is a patient who's 18 months out and had really what was felt to be an acceptable articular reduction, but you can see that he's already getting significant, you know, anterolateral uh, joint space narrowing here. Ankle fractures uh, are quite common, of course. They're a rotational mechanism of injury. We classify them as isolated malleolar, either medial or lateral malleolar versus bimalleolar versus trimalleolar. The Logie Hansen and Denny Weber classification schemes are, are in the literature and they're sort of diagrammatically represented here. I don't think they're really clinically relevant now. Um, we, we talk about these really using the AOOTA classification scheme now as either, uh, these are 44 injuries, and the, the AO classification scheme basically follows the Denny Weber scheme. And the A fractures are ones that are infrasyndesmotic, the Bs are transsyndesmotic, and the Cs are suprasyndesmotic, and that's all diagrammatically represented here. Biomechanics of the ankle, remember that the deep portion of the deltoid ligament is the primary restraint to anterolateral displacement of the talus. So if the deltoid is disrupted, either through a, a fracture of the medial malleolus or a deltoid tear, then there's nothing that will prevent the talus from displacing laterally. Also, the fibula is very important to prevent lateral displacement of the talus, acts as a buttress. So that becomes, uh, these are very important things to remember. And the goal of treatment of ankle fractures is to anatomically reduce the talus within the ankle mortis. It's not necessarily to obtain anatomical reduction of the fibula or the medial malleolus, but basically to anatomically reduce the talus within the ankle mortis. We know that even one millimeter of talus shift within the ankle mortis significantly affects the tibio-talar contact area. So for that reason, you do not want to accept any displacement of the talus in the mortis. Any talar displacement would be an indication for anatomic reduction in fixation. For isolated malleolar fractures of the medial malleolus, tip avulsions can be treated symptomatically and typically with uh, weight bearing to comfort. If you have a non or minimally displaced a true malleolar fracture through the, uh, the, the main bony portion of the malleolus, then you can treat those either in a short leg walking cast or a cast boot. Those are typically stable injuries and will heal well. Um, for isolated lateral malleolar fractures, and these are ones in which you have an intact ankle mortise. 
So again, the talus is not shifted laterally. The tr this treatment is somewhat controversial. Traditionally, it was believed that these fractures, if there was any displacement of the fibula, needed to be treated with ORIF. However, recent studies have shown that up to three millimeters of lateral malleolar displacement can be well tolerated with non-operative treatment as long as, again, the talus is anatomically reduced within the mortise. Bimalleolar fractures, if you have any lateral Taylor displacement, that is an indication for ORF. And that typically is done using one or more lag screws for the fibula as well as a neutralization plate. And the medium allelis, you can use Kinsella's lag screws with or without a tension band wire. What about the functional bimalleolar fracture? That's a patient that has a lateral malleolus fracture, fracture of the distal fibula, with a significant deltoid tear, as you see here. I mean, the talus cannot displace this far laterally without there being significant medial soft tissue injury. Uh, so you'd perform an ORF for the lateral malleolus, and there has been some uh, speculation on whether it would be useful to you know, acutely explore and repair the deltoid ligament, well, the bottom line is don't do it. That's not been shown to be associated with the increased result. The only indication for medial exploration in the functional bimalleolar, frac bimalleolar fractures is when you're unable to anatomically reduce the talus within the mortise of the ankle joint. Trimalleolar fractures, when do you fix the posterior malleolar fragment? Uh, if the fragment involves greater than 25% of the articular surface, or if it's displaced more than two millimeters. Those would be indications for reduction in fixation. This, this fragment can typically be reduced quite well through your lateral incision. You make the, the plate the fibula, can reach behind the back of the, uh, the, of the tibia, you know, catch that posterior malleolar fragment with a dental pick or some similar instrument, pull it down, and then use a couple of anterior to posterior oriented lag screws to uh, obtain your fixation. What about syndesmotic disruption? This is something also that seems to show up a lot on examinations. How do we assess it? Well, you're looking for the clear space and the overlap between the tibia and the fibula, and you want to look one centimeter above the joint. It's very important in patients where you suspect the possibility of a, of a syndesmotic injury, and these would be the type C fractures with supra syndesmotic fibula fractures to assess for the stability intraoperatively. And how do you do that? Well, you apply an abduction and external rotation stress to the ankle, look at it fluoroscopically, and if you see increased medial clear space, then that is an indication uh, that the syndesmosis is unstable and needs fixation. Now, in general, when the fibula fracture is within 4.5 centimeters of the joint, syndesmotic fixation is not required. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't assess it intraoperatively and really assess for the stability of the, of the situation. If you're going to treat a patient with a syndesmosis disruption, how do you do it? Well, you, you can use a single cortical screw. It's very important that you not place this screw using lag technique. You do not want to lag across the syndesmosis. You typically want to place the screw two centimeters above the joint. You can use a three-five screw or a four-five screw. You can go three cortices. You can go four cortices. There's not been shown to be any uh, difference between uh, any of those techniques. Um, we used to think that you would should dorsiflex the ankle when you put these screws in, but now it's been shown by uh, Paul Trinetta's work that it's really not possible to over-compress the syndesmosis or dor dorsiflexion is not necessary. Um, what about taking the screws out? If you leave the screw in, there's a 30% risk that the screw will break. So some believe that that's an indication for removing the screw. If you're going to remove it and you believe that's important to do that, definitely do not remove it before three months because that's how long it takes for the syndesmotic ligaments to heal. Outcomes of ankle fractures, overall success rates in the literature are reported at 90%. There's no question that for a bimalleolar fracture, ORF has been shown to be superior to closed treatment. However, although we report good to excellent results in the 90% range, you should understand that these patients typically do have significant long-term functional impairment. Also, prolonged recovery is inspected, expected. It should be advised to patients that it may take up to two years for them to obtain their final functional result in, in healing of these ankle fractures. Complications of ankle fractures, wound problems, 4 to 5 percent, deep infection, 1 to 2 percent. Uh, Post-traumatic arthrosis is rare, assuming that you get an anatomical reduction of the talus within the ankle mortise. Beware the ankle fracture in the diabetic patient. Very high complication rate, deep infection rates reported up to 20 percent. Open fractures of the ankles, uh, of course, require emergent operative debridement. Then it is safe to proceed with immediate ORIF. You do not need to worry about delaying your fixation, and the results for lower-grade open fractures are similar to those reported for closed fractures.
Achilles tendon ruptures occur uh, typically two to four centimeters above the calcaneal insertion of the Achilles tendon. You can diagnose it uh, clinically with the, the Thompson calf squeeze test. And remember that the, the diagnosis can be missed in up to 25% of cases. The treatment is individualized to the patient, the patient's expectations. Um, you can treat them surgically or non-surgically. Basically, if you're doing a surgical repair, it's typically done through a posterior medial incision using non-absorbable suture. The benefit of surgical treatment over non-surgical treatment is that it has been shown to lead to a decreased re-rupture rate and increased plantar flexion strength with, with operative repair. So those are the, the things that you present to a patient. Uh, percutaneous surgery is not recommended because it has been shown to result in uh, weaker repairs. All right, we're down to the hind foot now. We're coming in the home stretch. Taylor neck fractures. Um, greater than 50% of all Taylor fractures do involve the neck of the talus. The mechanism is a forced dorsiflexion injury to the hind foot with an axial load. And, of course, there's a very high incidence of complications with Taylor neck fractures, specifically osteonecrosis. The Hawkins classification of Taylor neck fractures, uh, Hawkins 1 is a truly non-displaced fracture of the Taylor neck. A Hawkins 2 is a displaced fracture with involvement of the subtalar joint. A Hawkins 3, displaced fracture with subtalar and tibiotalar involvement, the body of the talus is dislocated, and then a Hawkins 4 is the worst uh, type of fracture where you have di dis dislocation of the subtalar, tibiotalar, and talonavicular joints. And if you notice on this, there's an increased risk of osteonecrosis of the talus as you go from a Hawkins 1 to a Hawkins 4. With a Hawkins 4, the incidence of osteonecrosis is essentially 100%. The treatment of Taylor neck fractures, we do believe that displaced fractures require urgent uh, treatment with ORIF, and an anatomical reduction is, is absolutely essential in treating these fractures. The, the, the long-term complication of Taylor neck fractures that is preventable is malunion. Uh, so, and you can, by obtaining an anatomical reduction, you can prevent that. Even with an anatomical reduction, you cannot necessarily prevent later onset of osteonecrosis. That's something that often is unavoidable. But the most preventable complication is, is malunion or, or um, uh, particularly a varus malunion of the bone. Um, beware of the patient that has significant dorsomedial comminution. Most of these tail neck fractures that are high energy will have that dorsomedial comminution. And for that reason, really two incision, a dual incision technique is preferred for fixation. Um, screws are much better than wires for fixing these fractures, so don't try to fix them percutaneously with wires. It doesn't work. Two 4.0 millimeter screws are typically indicated. You, of course, need fluoroscopy. And if possible, post screws oriented from the posterior aspect of the tailor body to the anterior portion are strong, create a stronger construct than screws placed in an anterior to posterior orientation. Consider using titanium screws because of the uh, desire to likely obtain MRI examination of these patients post-operatively post to assess for the presence or absence of osteonecrosis. Uh, the patient should be kept non-weight bearing for 10 to 12 weeks. The, the sign that we're looking for, the, the good sign that we're looking for is the Hawkins sign. It's subchondral lucency on the AP x-ray. You'll typically see it at about six to eight weeks post-injury. And if you see a Hawkins sign, that is a good thing because that indicates that bony resorption is occurring and bony resorption cannot occur without intact vascularity. So remember that a Hawkins sign is a, is a, is a positive finding in these injuries. Uh, complications, subtalar arthritis, 50% uh, of the time. Tibiotalar arthritis, 33%. Uh, as you see, varus malunion, again, re keep that in mind. If you have that, uh, then that typically requires a triple arthrodesis. And if you have osteonecrosis develop of the, of the Taylor dome, that the standard treatment for that would be a tibiocalcaneal fusion, fusion across both the tibiotalar and the subtalar joints. Taylor process fractures, this is an example of a medial process fracture here. Lateral process fractures are much more common, however. They're often they're missed. The patients will present to you with a six to eight week history of, of ankle pain after, a, after having been seen by someone and told that they had a bad ankle sprain. Um, if you have a non-displaced fracture, they can be treated successfully in a short leg cast for about six weeks with non-weight bearing. If you have displaced process fractures, those usually require operative treatment with either internal fixation of large fragments or excision of small fragments that are not amenable to fixation. Subtalar dislocations are a result of high energy. They often are open. 85% of subtalar dislocations are medial. 
Uh, the treatment for it is a closed reduction and a short leg cast for four to six weeks. These injuries typically can be reduced closed. If, they are irredu if you have an irreducible lateral dislocation, you should suspect that it's the posterior tibial tendon. That's the culprit that's in the way. If you have an irreducible medial dislocation, either the extensor digitorum brevis or some associated osteochondral fractures of the talus could be preventing your reduction. And that's what you need to think about. Calcaneal fractures are the result of an axial load, typically a fall from a height or a motor vehicle collision. Uh, posterior facet involvement is the rule in these fractures that require operative intervention, as well as blowout of the lateral wall. The calcaneal cuboid joint is involved approximately two-thirds of the time, and the deformity that these fractures present with is a shortening, widening, and varus malalignment of the heel. Uh, the Sanders classification scheme is the one that's used and uh, is based on the coronal CT image through the posterior facet. A type 1 is where the posterior facet is completely non-displaced. A type 2 is where you have a single fracture line through the posterior facet. A 3, where you have a secondary fracture line with three posterior facet fragments. And type 4, you have four or more fragments. This is the primary fracture line here in a calcaneal fracture that goes from superior lateral to inferior medial. Non-operative treatment of calcaneal fractures is indicated for non-displaced fractures, extra-articular fractures um, that represent about 25% of all calcaneal fractures. Treat them with a cast or a cast boot. You want to get them moving their ankles and hind foots early. And remember that if you have an articular fracture, closed reduction, such as a, a bowler type of technique, will not restore the articular congruity. You can do an effective treatment for extra-articular fractures with closed reduction techniques, but if you have posterior facet involvement, a closed reduction maneuver will not not affect reduction of the joint. Operative treatment, there's a lot of controversy in the operative treatment of calcaneal fractures. What surgical approach do you use? What type of implant do you use? Should you bone graft them? How do you treat them postoperatively? And most significantly, are the results of operative treatment uh, better than treating them non-operatively? Um, you can say that there's definitely been a trend in the last decade towards surgical intervention. We're still analyzing the results in uh, some uh, very important uh, multicenter studies regarding this issue. The goal of operative treatment is to restore the calcaneal anatomy, re uh, re you know, minimize the, the shortening, the varus malalignment, uh, the lateral wall blowout, you know, re restore the anatomy, the tuberosity of the calcaneus, and reduce the posterior facet. It's clearly been shown that there's no benefit to early surgery because just as with fractures of the tibial plafond, significant soft tissue injuries associated with these fractures, and that would uh, prevent you op operating on them early in most cases. The operative treatment, you can do a medial approach, lateral approach, or some combination thereof. The most common approach is the extensile lateral approach, which was uh, popularized by uh, Benershka and uh, St. George in Seattle. You use a low-profile implant. Wound complications are common even in the most experienced hands and, in, and have been reported in up to 10 to 20 percent of cases. Increased risk of wound healing problems should be expected in smokers and patients with diabetes. Complications of calcaneal fractures, compartment syndrome occurs about 10 percent of the time. Of course, heel deformities and malunion are quite common if the, if the reduction is not appropriate and subtalar uh, post-traumatic arthrosis. Factors that have been associated with a poor outcome include older age, obesity, manual laborer, and workers' compensation cases, of course. Finally, midfoot injuries, um, dorsal lip avulsion fractures of the navicular are the most common type of navicular fracture. Fortunately, they can be treated symptomatically most of the time in a short leg cast. Tuberosity fractures involve the insertion of the posterior tibialis tendon. If they involve the articular surface, then those should be treated with uh, ORIF. Um, Navicular body fractures are, by definition, intraarticular. They have an increased risk of arthrosis and should be treated with ORIF. And finally, stress fractures of the navicular typically occur in the central one-third of the bone, may require CT scan for diagnosis, and they should be treated uh, with short leg casts with non-weight bearing. Cuboid fractures, avulsions of the cuboid are treated symptomatically and, and do quite well. The so-called nutcracker injury to the cuboid is a compression fracture that occurs w between the calcaneus and the metatarsals more distally. And that will shorten the lateral column of the foot, and that requires operative treatment either with internal fixation or a spanning external fixator on the lateral column of the foot to reestablish the lateral column length. Forefoot injuries, list frank injuries, uh, injuries are to the tarsometatarsal joints, high energy trauma, usually associated with fractures of the metatarsals, and very subtle list frank injuries can be missed. So it's, again, important to have a high index of suspicion. You diagnose them with plain films on the AP view. You're looking for the alignment 
of the medial aspect of the second metatarsal with the medial aspect of the middle cuneiform. And this is a fairly subtle injury here that was missed and showed up in our clinic several weeks later. On the oblique view, you're looking for the alignment of the fourth metatarsal with the cuboid. On the lateral view, you're looking for dorsal displacement of the metatarsal phalangeal joints. We classify them as you see here, homolateral, isolated, or divergent. ORIF is indicated for most Lisfranc frank injuries unless medical contraindications to surgery exist. You can get by with treating the lateral column injuries with closed reduction and percutaneous pinning, but the more medial injuries do require formal ORIF. Anatomical reduction is your goal. It has been shown to be associated with improved results. You use one or two dorsal incisions. And remember that there's no role for acute arthrodesis in these cases, again, because ORF has been shown to be superior. Uh, you can use K-wires or screws or some combination thereof. You want to get the midfoot moving early postoperatively. Protected weight bearing is important and hardware removal. If you're using K-wires, you take them out at six to eight weeks. If you're using screws, um, if you're concerned about the possibility of the screws breaking, you have that conversation with the patient. You can take those out anywhere from three to six months, but certainly not sooner than three months. Um, improved results, again, have been shown with anatomical reduction. However, altered gait and post-traumatic arthrosis of the midfoot are quite common with these injuries, even with successful treatment, and these fractures can be a source of significant long-term disability and pain. Metatarsal fractures are quite common. You have to rule out an associated uh, list frank injury before you determine that these fractures should be treated non-operatively. Uh, most metatarsal fractures, fortunately, can be treated non-operatively. If you're going to operate on them, you can, a lot of fixation options are available, plates, uh, wires, screws, etc. Non-operative treatment consists of either a cast or a healing shoe and allowing the patient to weight bear to comfort. These are some uh, fractures of the fourth and fifth metatarsal shafts, which will do quite well with non-operative treatment. Operative indications would include patients with open fractures or fractures of the border metatarsals, the first or fifth metatarsals, with significant shortening where you would expect shortening of the medial or lateral column of the foot respectively, or the patient with multiple metatarsal fractures. Uh, the Jones fracture is an important thing to remember. It's a fracture at the proximal metadiaphyseal junction right here of the fifth toe. It has a very high incidence of nonunion. Conservative treatment for the Jones fracture consists of a short leg cast and non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks. If you treat the patient in this manner, you can expect that about 12% of them will require late surgery. If you have a high-demand patient, such as an athlete, you can consider immediate operative intervention with percutaneous screw fixation. Faster healing and return to function has been shown to, be with the, shown to occur with this technique. Beware the, the sural nerve when you're doing this technique. Metatarsal phalangeal joint dislocations are relatively uncommon. When they do occur, they're typically dorsal. The first metatarsal phalangeal joint is more commonly injured than the, than the lesser toes. The treatment is closed reduction, uh, then a short leg walking cast or healing shoe. If, the fra if you have a fracture dislocation, those reductions will typically be unstable and will require percutaneous pinning typically. Turf toe is a hyperextension injury to the hallux, can result in loss of motion. The treatment is with um, um, rest, uh, elevation, et cetera, NSAIDs, and taping. Uh, phalangeal fractures are best treated non-operatively in the majority of cases. You can buddy tape them, allow the patient to weight bear to to as tolerated, range of motion exercises. Occasionally, surgery could be indicated for a significantly displaced intraarticular fracture of the hallux. Intraarticular fractures of the lesser toes should be treated non-operatively. Uh, the last thing I want to cover is compartment syndrome of the foot. Again, compartment syndrome is the result of crushing high-energy trauma associated with the, the things you should look for that should raise your index of suspicion for compartment syndrome would be multiple metatarsal fractures, list frank injuries, and calcaneal fractures. Again, a clinical suspicion is the most important factor in making the diagnosis. Compartment pressure measurements can be performed to corroborate your clinical diagnosis. Remember that there are nine compartments in the foot um, as listed here. Uh, the treatment, of course, is emergent surgical fasciotomy. Typically, you can decompress the foot adequately through two dorsal incisions. You may need to make a separate medial incision um, as well, and the late sequelae, if the compartment syndrome is not treated appropriately, would be claw toes. Um, that's it. Um, I want to um, leave you guys with this uh, word of encouragement here. And in all honesty, I do want to wish you good luck. And um, please remember that as you go through your careers that trauma is not a random disease.